Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you. Lorraine Johnson. Lorraine Johnson. James Lump. James Lumston. James Lumston. Michael Lewis. Here. Thank you. And Steve Bean. Here. Great. Thank you. We do have a quorum. I'm sorry, this is Lorraine. Were you able were you able to hear me? Uh, we can now, thank you. Okay, thank you. So Jim Lumston's the only one. Yes. Welcome everyone to the Supplemental Retirement Board of Trustees meeting uh, of August 26th at 9 a.m. If you'll stand and join us in our pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is our North Carolina salute. I salute the flag of North Carolina. And pledge to the old North state, state of loyalty and faith. faith. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll need to order. Welcome all the members of the uh, Board of Trustees, those that are here in person and and uh, with the telephone. It will be a public comment period for organizations and individuals to address the board later in the agenda. End of the meeting, please. Uh, go to meeting, please sign up for public comments uh, via the check box. If you are attending in person, please sign in via the sign in sheet. We uh, pivoting, uh, continuing with the Department of State Treasurer's initiative to increase transparency. We've established a policy to record audio and video of official public meetings like this one and make recordings available on our department's website. This is an effort to increase. Uh, transparency and accessibility of public meetings that fall under the authority of the Department of State Treasurer. And as a result, this meeting is being recorded uh, under this initiative. I want to make uh, several things known regarding our compliance with law regarding remote meetings. Uh, number one, we'll take a roll call by name. You leave the meeting at any time or any point, please announce your departure. If you return, please announce your return. The item, these items must be recorded in the meeting. Your destination is on the way. And likewise, please state your name before speaking. We'll take all votes by roll call. Uh, if without objection, anybody who makes a motion or a second to a motion for efficiency purposes will consider those to be yes votes without objection. <clears throat> None. I finally text other recorded communications between board members during the meeting, even on personal cell phones or or public records to the extent that they concern the matters of the meeting. <clears throat> I want to extend a warm welcome to our guest, uh, Michael Nolan from Prudential and John Reed from Cowan. And I want to congratulate DST staff and the board whose work has been recognized with two, not one, but two leadership awards from the National Association of Government Defined Contribution Administrators, otherwise known as NAG. Uh, uh, we receive awards in the categories of technology and interactive multimedia, which you know I had nothing to do with that. We got those awards for technology and interactive multimedia. <clears throat> and our uh, work that we did to promote National Retirement Security Month. In addition, we're very pleased to report to this board that we are one of four finalists uh, for the NAGNUS President's Award. 
which is given annually to a public service retirement plan that has championed a participant first mentality. I love that word, participant first mentality. The award will be presented via Zoom on September 16th. Staff will send the Zoom meeting information to board members who will be able to attend. That was a lot. <laughs> Ethics, awareness, identification. Uh, members, you have the agenda before you. Uh, please take a moment to review the agenda, which I believe you already have. Does anyone have an actual potential or the appearance of a conflict of interest regarding matters that are before us? Okay. <laughs> Hearing none, um, I will uh, ask the clerk to call the roll. So we called the roll earlier, and I just want to check, is, has James Lumsden joined? Okay, so we are good. Everyone's here but James. Okay. All right, and with that, I'll entertain a motion to accept the meeting minutes from May 27th. Oh, Linda Barron, so moved. Shavella Thomas, second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Hearing now the clerk call roll. Pleasure, Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Michael Lewis. Did you hear me? Yes. Aye. Nels Roseland. Aye. Steve Bean. Aye. And Wyndon Hibbler. Aye. Thank you all. I probably should have asked the legal counsel if I could have combined those two motions, but since I didn't do that, I'll entertain a motion to approve the meeting minutes of July 14th. Linda Barron, so moved. Second. Nels Rosen. Thank you, Nels. Uh, motion second being made. Any further discussion? Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Savella Thomas? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Lorraine Aye. Johnson? Aye. Aye. Michael Lewis? Aye. Steve Bean? Aye. And Wyndon Hibbler? Aye. Thank you. Our next item is item number five for legal matters. Uh, Lee Chisholm will present some of these uh, for board consideration, which uh, will uh, affect plan policies and therefore require a vote. Mr. Chair, do we want to have uh, Sam Watts speak first on the resolution? Okay. Members, I want to recognize Sam Watts, who's our legislative liaison, uh, who represents me, varied uh, interest here at the Office of State Treasurer. Uh, if, uh, want to know why he gets around the General Assembly so quickly. He has those wheels in the back of his shoes like those kids used to have. So he just wheels around. <laughs> but uh, uh, any, he has the highest degree of respect at, at the Treasurer's Office at, as the ambassador for the Treasurer's Office of the General Assembly. And uh, Sam, welcome. And uh, we look forward to your report regarding the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. Um, I want to apologize to you for having to come to you and ask for this. Um, it's not something that really should have been escalated to the level of uh, involving um, every board uh, that we have in the Department of State Treasurer. Uh, the, the issue before us and the reads of the resolution to you last night, I believe, excellent job of um, crafting it and um, customizing it to the specifics on the supplemental retirement plans. The issue before us is comes up every four or five years and has for the last 30 to 40 years uh, come up that way. Because when you look in the accounting system or when you're the budget officer or you people in the budget office or at the fiscal research, they, they tend to ask, well, why is the Department of State Treasurer this anomaly in the, in the process? Why are things different? And we normally, um, we normally ask um, it, to just let us explain it to you. So explain that the uh, investments for 
members of the retirement systems are owned by the members of the retirement systems. The treasurer is a fiduciary. In this case, the Supplemental Retirement Plans Board is a fiduciary and shares part of that responsibility and that you can't interpose a non-fiduciary between the fiduciary and the owner of the funds. Um, and then we also explain just the practical matter of it. How would we set, how would we ever uh, be able to um, make investment contracts if the General Assembly could come in 12 months after and overrule the fact that we had made expenditures or uh, made to, to, to pay for expenses of a fund? Or how would we ever um, manage the department under, the, under those circumstances? So we're different than other state agencies in that regard. It shows that that's anomaly. Um, and, and then it's particularly egregious because it's the first time we've actually seen language in a in legislation attempting to impose this on the supplemental retirement plans. If you take the fees that you set for members and you put them into the state budget, and the General Assembly could approve or not approve expenditures that you've already made, then how would you recover? After all that, who, who, where, where would you? It just wouldn't work. <clears throat> and so we normally explain that, and uh, normally staff members say, oh, okay, that, that makes sense. And if the issue goes away until you get new, another new person who looks at it and goes, well, is there a novel here? Uh, about 10 months ago, we started getting the same set of questions, and we're accustomed to answering. So we had a series of meetings that so were asking the questions. Um, Explained it very well. We even drew pictures. Um, and uh, this time, uh, the answers weren't accepted in the sort of normal way. We provided legal opinions from external counsel. But when the uh, first draft of the House budget, the first, they attempted to get the Senate budget, we explained it to the Senate staff. The Senate staff said, oh, we're not doing that. Uh, then the first draft of the House budget came out. The, lo and behold, the provision was there that would um, move all these things under the auspices of the General Assembly's direct control expenditures and expenses. And we uh, prevailed on members of the subcommittee, first level, with us to remove that provision from the draft of the budget on a six to seven vote. Next week, the chairman of the committee attempted to put the provision back in, the same provision back in. And um, because we had some good relationships and with members of the General Assembly uh, on both sides of the aisle, and some, honestly, there were some very smart attorneys who quickly caught on that you can't come between the fiduciary and the owner of the funds. We, we managed to win the surprise vote here on the 43 to 37 vote. Still pretty close, but. Um, Came up again the next day on the floor of the House. The, uh, the chairman of the committee tried to run an amendment. This time it went down because we had a little more time to work it, work the issue. It went down on probably three to one on a voice vote. Uh, but the next day the chairman tried again to get a, another another recorded vote on the matter. He wasn't able to get that, that fourth vote. And we know there have been conversations since attempting to get it into the final legislation coming from the General Assembly. So, We've uh, asked all the, the affected boards at the Department of State Treasurer to take a look at the issue um, and to provide an opinion that, opinion that we'll provide back from each board and collectively. Uh, so far as the Health Plan Board, which is a bipartisan, bipartisan board with appointments from the governor, wrote him and the speaker, took a unanimous vote in favor of uh, opposing opposition to this. Yesterday, the Investment Advisory Committee, which contains appointments from the Treasurer and the Pro Tem and the Speaker, um, and I believe uh, some gubernatorial appointees by virtue of being on other boards as well, uh, took a unanimous vote on a similar resolution to, to the one before you today. So we're asking that the supplemental retirement plans, and, and particularly important to us that that this, this board act on it because this is the first time we've seen or a staff go on an attempt to, to pull in the expenses from the supplemental plans. And that 
you know, it has a further complication, not just of the basic legal issue, but a large portion of the funds that are coming are derived from local governments, not just state government. It's state budget, so it's just layer upon layer of uh, complication. So we appreciate your support. Reed can answer any of the more detailed uh, legal questions, or uh, if anyone has any of those, um, I'm happy to answer the, the political questions. I think Jeff can probably support very deep into the details of, of how your how your investments work. But if you had to get your expenses approved a year later, and you also can disapprove them, try to function. Puzzle through some of those questions if there are questions. Okay. Uh, brief comment, then we'll go to. Once, uh, no, specifically, the statute that uh, um, was involved is the, um, the part of the statute that relates to administrative costs are two and a half basis points, five basis points. Um, and the change is that um, these, these uh, participant fees. Uh, shall be deposited with the state controller as a general fund, not tax revenue. No, sir. Just, hello, Sam. Thank you for the briefing. Just for a little background, um, is this a conference committee item? Has the House and the Senate concurred? Or has the Senate not allowed this in the House? I'm, you might have briefly referenced that. As you could. Uh, by the rules, it shouldn't be a conference committee item. However, we are aware that it is has specifically come up in the conference discussions. Uh, and then there's all there's also conversation that they could attempt to put it in the Budget Technical Corrections Act. Okay. Likely the Budget Technical Corrections Act, which are gonna have to adjust some things when the House and the Senate have both approved this? Or no, no one's approved. Okay. The Senate the Senate did not include it in their budget at all. The Senate the Senate chairs um, said they, they were not interested in doing so. Uh, the, the House chairs were pushing forward. The Senate chair told us that we need to get from the House and not. The Senate chair told us, quote, we will fall on the sword for you on this one if you can't, if you can't prevail on the House. Uh, although they understand the mistake. I think now that we see the language and see just how egregious a mistake this would be, that uh, it actually makes the argument easier. But it, it, it's because for 10 months we were shadow boxing with without knowing exactly what the coming guys thank you just to add before i go to uh, for linda we we didn't even see the amendment until it was passed out in in, in the appropriations committee so that's number one uh, number two this is was not in the senate budget and the house budget that passed it was not in the house budget but we continue to be diligent with this and uh, the boards that i chair which are over a dozen boards uh, but all these boards are made up of appointees of the governor, the Senate, and the House. And every board that uh, have approved them from all members, no matter who the, the appointee uh, part of the state government was. And I want to say that uh, this went through the subcommittee, it was defeated. It went through the appropriations committee, it was defeated. It got to the floor of the House. And folks like uh, Rachel Hunt, if you're not familiar with Rachel, she's Charlotte, um, daughter of Governor Hunt, a well-recognized attorney. Uh, she started looking at this language and looking, so she understands securities law. She said this is illegal what they're trying to do here. So it was a, it was a, we're sorry that he's here. We're sorry we're asking you to do this, but people who have come together from all parties to understand that this is not the right thing to do. Uh, it's been the only blessing out of this whole exercise. Is that, isn't this against the law? I mean, doesn't this challenge the essence of fiduciary duty? I think it's, as Sam put it, it is putting a step and putting at least one, if not several parties between the board and um, discharging its duty toward the plan participants. If these are participant fees, two and a half basis points, five basis points. It's the entirety of the operational budget um, for uh, 
plans. You know, on the I and D side, not, um, it's it's arguably the investment manager fees um, as well. Now, while that doesn't directly affect us, that is, I would hate for someone to look at that and say that's also the investment manager fees. That would be uh, that would be horrible, um, even even worse than the operational budget. And just to add, as Sam's already said, you know, the participants in the SRP plan are. Uh, third of our local governments. And so even splitting that out, because you know, we're talking about somebody trying to run a state law that impacts the funding of local governments. And it's very complicated. Maybe I missed this in your initial uh, discussion. Um, what's the motivation behind this? Um, Have not gotten a satisfactory answer from uh, the chairs on that. They just kept, keep simply saying, <coughs> "Need more transparency uh, on, 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 on your budget." We, we keep saying, "Okay, here's a quarterly investment report. Here's a report from supplement or trimer plan. Here are the meeting minutes. Here's our website. Here's everything. Report every number you could ever possibly want." Down to Kaffer. the Kaffer, the investment audits. The actual evaluations of the, of the retirement system. And this also affects the local government commission, the SGs fund. So in every report we do is about transparency. We are the uh, one of the most transparent, if not the most transparent agency, given the level of detail we, we offer um, of any agency in state government. Um, and the only place that the budget numbers that they would see you know, are maybe a few analysts in the state budget office and a few analysts in the fiscal research division are the only people that would have the um, access to the accounting systems to drill down to the level they're talking. So the, the transparency argument doesn't really hold any water. What we, we actually make and what came out on the floor of the house was it, um, it's really more about control. It's some some more wants to exercise more control uh, over all the programs in our agency. Yes, sir. This is winded and I'm, I'm just, I'm new, I'm trying to understand, but uh, the questions that pop in my head is, are, um, one is, could they reappropriate the money? If they, if, and, and are they saying they want to be the ones who set the budget? And if that's the case, does that stop us from being able to actually do our duties that we should be doing and i mean i have a from a i'm just saying from a math perspective all of the questions that come into my head it does it does it make it look like the state has more revenue than it has should have um, mm -hmm. you understand it would, it would if i did come back it would it would put all of the it would put Depending on how, how they wanted it, how they specifically wanted us to read it, you can put tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars more under both activity under control of the general government subcommittee. Um, and is there a benefit for that for him for that? Uh, I'm just asking questions. Um, I would, uh, I don't want to put staff in a I'm in, sorry, in an awkward position, but I but you. It's a great question. We, and this has nothing to do with the, you know, the stress that all governments are under right now with COVID. This is pre-COVID. As Sam says, this comes up, probably come up seven, six times in the last 55 years. And to also be crystal clear that the staffer that we've been dealing with on this issue, we've treated this individual with radical hospitality. There have been hundreds of hours spent in this room with all the subject matter experts, with this individual trying to get to the question of what problem are you trying to solve? And it's like a solution searching for a problem. And she would say, well, this, and we'd say, well, here it is, or that, and here it is. And then literally seven, eight hours later, 
the whole the whole round of the same exact same questions would come back at us. And uh, if we haven't worked together very long, but quickly realizing the frustration in my voice <laughs> that we haven't worked together. Because every minute we spend on this is a minute we cannot spend on the core functions of this operation, which is which is to focus on the participants. And uh, I don't know what else to say or where else to go uh, other than the fact that we are always interested in new information. We are always interested in a different way of looking at something that's already in our heads, a better way. <clears throat> but trying to find an answer and you know, solution of a problem is just, uh, it's just, there's no other word to describe it. It's just bizarre. And uh, this is where we are. And the most uh, frustrating part about all this, as you know, we, local government commission meets in this very room and the local government commission is under more pressure and local governments are under more pressure than any time during since the depression in North Carolina, especially rural North Carolina. And, you know, part of the comments that come out of these meetings is, you know, has the local government commission outlived its usefulness? You know, it's like a model that's been established in the United States for not, nearly 90 years. We're the only state that had one for a long period of time. So this is the sort of dialogue that we're having. And then <clears throat> the way that, that we're treated, like surprise, can, can we actually see the conference? Can we see the amendment? Can we see this? No. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's laid on the member's desk and they're asked to vote on it. So Sam's uh, done a great job and the staff here is supporting him. And we appreciate the board supporting this resolution. Just a commentary in my experience in state government, there's a constant tug and pull between the legislative branch and the executive branch. Across North Carolina has one of the weakest executives across the nation. No matter who the governor is, no matter who the executive boards are, we're an executive board. And you all may know a few months ago, I expressed a concern about legislative intensive management of our decisions. And I, I think we need to be consistent and support this resolution. If any contract we do business with, with any of our vendors, key vendors, business partners, that's subject to the public records law. Um, in my sense is this is common sense and helps us maintain the way we're doing business, which has been very effective. The mic from the phone. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, hi, this is Lorraine, and I had a couple of questions. I mean, the first one is just that you know, I mean, sure, I'm I'm fine with with passing passing this, but what's really going to stop this? Is it just going to have to land in court sometime? I mean, what what makes this? To be clear, that we had, had, we're trying to keep it from starting. So go ahead. Yeah, we we would prefer not to have to go beyond the, you know, we, we would prefer that it never go any further than it's gone already. Uh, we've had- Oh, sure, I mean, yeah, a lot we of would. But what... The legal team, and um, I, I will say we did let the, the leadership of both chambers of General Assembly know that this could very well um, land, if they did this, it would very likely land in court, um, whether that, whether the plaintiff was the, was the Department of State Treasurer uh, or the boards or possibly a, it, it, with regard to the defined benefit plans, you can, it would be a class action suit against the state. So we, 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 we warned and, and said you're, you're, you're trading on, on, on ground that you really uh, should not be trading on. Uh, but that's essentially, I, I, if the Treasurer wants to add any, any, any further directive that he may have uh, nothing else to add to that. I think uh, Lorraine had another question, and it, it, it just reminds me to tell, especially new board members, all we do here is watch pennies and paper clips. All we do is make money and save money. We save money and we share it with participants. That's all we do. So, Lorraine, do you have a follow up? Yeah, yeah no, no, that, uh, 
that covered it. But, you know, basically, the, the they're either going to back down and they're they're not, and if they don't, then we're the the recourse, I guess, is that was that was my question. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else from the telephone? Anything else you'd like to make? Uh, Go ahead. This is Michael. Uh, I was just going to just thank you for bringing it to our attention, and uh, obviously happy to support. Yeah. Nels, you just your comments in the form of a motion. I make a motion we approve the resolution presented to the board. Michael, would you care to second that? Uh, second. Okay, good. Uh, any further discussion? Take as long as you need. Hearing none, the motion in front of us to accept the resolution as presented by a legal and uh, legislative staff uh, regarding the SRP plan. Uh, hearing no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll. Okay, Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Mr. Bella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Melinda Barrett. Aye. Steve Bing. Um, and point out to the um, to the board that these are funds that a participant could have taken a withdrawal on when that participant left a previous employer, but instead chose to roll them over into the to the four hundred one k plan. Are there any questions um, regarding that? Uh, uh, one other thing to, to point out is that it may uh, may promote rollovers of of funds into the into the plan if you know you're not locking in um, funds that you already had the right to, to withdraw from the other plan. Any questions for staff about that? Any questions from the board or Ray? Then finally that the um, the proposed amendments formally incorporate the, the CARES Act uh, relief um, that you as a board adopted last year, in particular, increased loan amount, deferral loan repayments, coronavirus related distributions, and repayment of those um, distributions. So, this is to conform the plan documents to the board's actions last year. Any, are there any questions about those? The only thing I have about that is that when I was reading it, it, it seemed like it was just limited for that one instance. So, what happens if something like that happens in the future? So if there is another, say, a, 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 another coronavirus related event, there would, um, you know, if, if Congress acted the way it did last year, provided some relief, we would have a special board meeting. That's what we did last year. We had a, a staff drafted some recommendations, a resolution based on the CARES Act, brought it to the board in a special board meeting. We enacted that through Prudential, and then we have some time to bring our documents up to speed, and that's what we're doing here. And, and so we would presumably go through that process again. Related to that, um, there was several participant transactions to take a significant level of scope of activity to take advantage of those provisions last year. My understanding is the eligibility expired the end of December uh, to do CARES Act withdrawals, loans, and special yes. allowances. Does this, in effect, ensure that our plan documents grandfather them in or that, that sure the legal basis is solid as we transition the way we frame our I guess our legal business authority for doing business. That, that's that's correct. It's just to have our our document reflects how we run the plans. And sometimes, well, a lot of times, you can have a, a, a change and then some time from the IRS to implement that formally in your documents without having to wait to implement that in, in reality. But you do need, given that you do have to run your plan according to the documents, you need to formally update your documents to show how you ran the plan. Any other questions from the board members for Reed? 
All right. Uh, so do I have a motion for approval of the plan document amendments uh, presented in the board's meeting materials? Chavella Thomas, I move that this be approved. Thank you, Chavella. Do we have a second? Uh, Michael Lewis, second. Michael, Michael, second. All right. Take the roll. Okay, Treasurer Falwell. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Linda Barron. Aye. Nels Roseland. Aye. Steve Bain. Aye. And Wendy Nippler. Aye. Thank you. Uh, we're now on to yes, two, two, two brief items. One is our um, contract for tax services. And may I mention that we renewed our contract uh, with Ernst and Young for foreign tax services through the first quarter of next year. Our intent to uh, run a procurement. We've started drafting those documents and bring a recommendation to the board um, in December. Um, and also, um, following up on another item, the, um, um, as you may remember in December, um, the board passed a resolution in support of uh, statutory flexibility to set the administrative fees below somewhere between zero and the current rates of two and a half and five basis points. Cause right now we can do an either or. Um, we received that passed. The General Assembly was signed into law on uh, July 2nd. Are there any questions about either one of those? And for Wyndham, uh, this uh, we charge administrative fee to our participants. And the law literally said it can zero, which is a fee holiday, which we've been doing for the last three years, or it has to be this. So we're Sometimes we can actually just cut the fee in half, but their law didn't allow us to cut the fee in half. It said this, or it said this. So that's what we've got now. We've got flexibility. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, before I get into the contract, I wanted to circle back to a question that was raised by Steve Beam at the May board meeting. Um, he had asked a question in regards to providing an economic incentive to terminated participants to encourage them to retain their balances in the plan. Uh, based on some of the uh, work that we've done, um, you know, what we find is that the IRS does uh, allow the plan sponsor um, a lot of discretion in how they allocate those expenses. Um, but there's really two main things that the uh, method of allocation must meet. Um, and that is that uh, there must be, there must be a rational basis for the method that they select. And there must be a reasonable relationship um, to the services that are provided. And so in looking at trying to provide a lower fee to terminated participants, um, we felt like if we did that, that would probably uh, appear as if we were shifting some of that economic burden from the terminated participants to the active participants. And therefore, at this point in time, we don't uh, feel like we should do that. We think that we should still, we should still continue to encourage our terminated participants to remain in the plan based on the value that they already derive from our services, as well as the low fees that we already have in the plan. So just wanted to circle back with you, Mr. Bean. Does that help answer the question that you raised last time? Yes, thank you very much for the follow-up. You are welcome. Okay, the uh, next thing we wanted to get into is um, some of our uh, service provider contracts. The first one we have is our Bank of New York Mellon's contract for custodial services, the SRP staff is recommending to the board that we exercise our final one-year contract renewal with Bank of New York Mellon, extending the contract uh, through the end of December 2023. And, it, and in consideration for this one-year renewal, uh, Bank of New York Mellon will provide us with 
an expense with an additional expense reduction of $35,000 on our annual fee. Uh, they've also provided to us and allowed us to implement the smart, smart allocator service for the plans at no expense to the plans, which, um, which represents about a $25,000 savings. So again, in, in exchange, we received about $60,000 in, in value uh, to uh, sign this last, this last loan year. Any questions? Thank you. And is a paper, please. Do we need to take a vote on each one of these independently? Okay. So we have a recommendation from staff uh, regarding the approval of the NY Mellon contract renewal for 2023 on the terms as presented. So I hear a motion. Mellon. Who was that on the phone? Shabella? Shabella is the second. So we have a motion and a second on the floor. Uh, any further discussion? Jeff, thank you and staff for that uh, great uh, negotiation. Uh, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Okay. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Aye. Michael Lewis? Aye. Nels Roseland? Aye. Steve Bain? Aye. And Wyndon Hibbler? Aye. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we'll go to record keeping. Yes, now we will talk about the record keeping contract. So, again, here the staff is recommending to the board that we exercise our final one year contract renewal with Prudential extending the contract uh, to December 2023. In consideration for this one year renewal, Prudential um, has agreed to an additional expense reduction of approximately $700,000. Most of that savings is coming from a reduction in the per account fee from $28 per account to $26 per account. And in exchange for that, we we here at the state have also agreed to allow them to make some uh, back office operational changes uh, as they may see fit. Any questions? Y yes, Any questions? Uh, this, is, this is Steve. Um, what, was it 700,000 you said in savings? Yes, yes sir. Okay, and and type of changes that they're allowed to make. Um, what does that involve? Uh, if you're saving that much additional money, is there anything um, that we might should be worried about that they would cut out? And so the uh, so the changes uh, really allow them to um, outsource to one of their partners some of the back office transaction processing. Uh, it's something that they've been doing with um, with other clients and uh, staff does not have any concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Steve, I will add that uh, there was a buffet of things that were on the table uh, regarding things they wanted uh, and things uh, and we ultimately agreed to just a couple of things in, in exchange for this uh, tremendous rate reduction. So, uh, but I just want to tell you that the buffet of things uh, was pretty expansive, maybe you know, I mean, less than a dozen, but, but uh, we appreciate Jeff holding the line uh, on this and once again driving a good negotiation. Modest work was done by Mary before she left uh, to give him credit for credit to you. And uh, once again, it's all based on uh, the ultimate value that it brings to our participants, not to our staff, not to Prudential, but to our participants. Okay. 
Thank you. I, I'm happy to make a motion to approve this. That'd be great, Steve. Motion made. Do I hear a second? Second, Melinda. Thanks, Melinda. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on accepting staff's recommendation for the renewal of the potential contract as presented by staff? Hearing none, clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell? Aye. Mr. Bella Thomas? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Aye. Michael Lewis? Aye. Nels Roseland? Aye. And Wyndon Hibbler? Aye. Thank you all very much. We're now down to uh, Michael Reed uh, from CEN Benchmarking. Hello, can you hear me? We can. That's great. Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, today. Uh, presenting from uh, just outside Toronto, Canada, I'm here to present the uh, Benchmark DC results uh, for the North Carolina Supplemental Retirement Plans for the five years ending December 31st, 2020. Uh, next page, please. Okay. Our database, uh, which forms the basis for this analysis, continues to uh, be strong. In fact, yours was one of the earlier reports uh, this year, and I'm pleased to report that the participation for 2020 is actually uh, a fair bit larger than represented on this slide, with 125 uh, large U.S. corporate and government plans participating, representing a record $1.3 trillion in assets and 9.7 uh, million participants. Next slide, please. From our overall database, we select a group of similar funds to uh, form the basis of the majority of the comparisons. Uh, this peer group is composed of 13 uh, public uh, plans uh, with rate that range in size from 3.8 billion to 18.2 billion. Uh, as compared to your $14.6 billion in assets, so you are one of the larger uh, plans within the peer group. Uh, the peer group has is fairly consistent year over year. Uh, this year we have added one new participant, the state of California. They are another large public DC plan uh, which provides an additional comparison and they are new to uh, using our service so that's why they've been added this year. Uh, next slide. Here are some high level comparisons between both you and the peer group and the universe of plans. A few things that I just want to point out that I'm going to, that are going to be relevant for uh, the rest of my presentation. Uh, one, like I said before, your plan at 14.6 billion is slightly larger than the median fund within your peer group at 11.4 billion and uh, more than double the median fund in our overall universe at 6.8 billion. Uh, your average account balance is actually lower uh, than peers and significantly lower than the U.S. universe. Uh, this will have th that means uh, since your overall assets are higher, but your average account balance is lower, that means you have many more members than both peers and the U.S. universe. Uh, just one note: uh, the median, the average fund balance for the U.S. universe is uh, so much larger because of the number of corporates. Uh, funds that participate and, and often the corporate 401k may be the only uh, form of retirement savings available to employees, whereas in the public space, uh, they're often supplemental plans. Uh, lastly, another item that I wanna point out, which has a, a big impact on cost and will get discussed a little bit more, is the average percentage of assets indexed. So that's the percentage of assets that are invested uh, passively as opposed to actively uh, for your plan that was 44 percent which is lower than peers of 59 and lower than the universe average at 65 percent uh, next slide please uh, your fund lineup is obviously very important uh, for members and, and it's also a big determinant of, of cost and performance uh, returns for your members uh, overall, you have 12 options available to members, and that's counting the target date or goal maker service suite of funds as one. Uh, that compares to a peer average of 13.8 funds and a universe average of 15. 
Uh, if you look at the table in the upper right, you will see in most areas you are roughly in line uh, with peers uh, with your offering. Uh, so, so very consistent with what other other systems are doing. Similarly, your default option uh, being the target date suite is uh, similar to 92% of peers who have uh, the target date funds as their default option. Uh, this is obviously very common now and, and has been perhaps the biggest change in uh, plan design over the last 15 years or so. Uh, one last point to make here, uh, with respect to your goal matrix portfolios, you are a little bit differentiated from your peers and the universe in that you offer three different options uh, within the goal maker portfolio, specifically a, a conservative, a moderate, and an aggressive option for each uh, fund. Uh, this is not overly common. So you have 27 target date options in total as compared to a peer average of 11.8. Next slide, please. So this slide shows your raw cost against uh, the U.S. universe cost, as well as um, showing it on a, on a per participant basis. I just quickly want to explain the box plots because uh, there will be a few more of them. So I think it's important that everyone understand what they represent. Uh, in each one, you'll see the outside of the box, the top of the box represents the 75th percentile. Uh, the bottom of the box represents the 25th percentile. So essentially 25% of the observed values reside below the box. 25% of the observed values occur above the box with 50% or half of the values occurring uh, within the box. The median, that being uh, the, the middle observed value is represented by the black line across each box. Uh, the whiskers extending from the boxes uh, extend out to the 90th percentile value at the top and the 10th percentile value on the bottom. Uh, from a cost perspective against peers, uh, your plan cost of 25.6 basis points is pretty much right on the median as compared to peers at 25.8, uh, but quite a bit uh, above the U U.S. universe median of 20.7 basis points. Uh, you might recall that for the U.S. universe, uh, the percentage of indexed assets was quite a bit higher uh, than both your fund and the peer group, and that is the reason for that uh, differential in cost. On a per participant basis, uh, your costs are quite low compared to both peers and the U U.S. universe, approximately 30th percentile against peers and uh, uh, around uh, 15th percentile against the U.S. universe. And again, this is reflective of the fact that uh, you have a larger uh, plan, plan population. Next slide, please. So on this slide, we present some trends and uh, quite dramatic trends at that. Uh, if we look at the top right-hand corner, the trend in total plan cost is a percentage of assets. Your costs represented by the green line have decreased from 47 basis points in 2016 to uh, 26 basis points in 2020, a very uh, market decrease. And uh, the primary driver behind this return of this reduction in cost has been an increase in the percentage of your assets that are being held in indexed or passive uh, investment strategies. Uh, that has increased from 29% of assets in 2016 to 44% uh, in 2020. Uh, we can see similar but less uh, severe declines in uh, peer costs as well as universe costs. And again, uh, similar reasons underlying those declines. Uh, you can see from average investment costs, so these are excluding uh, administrative and record keeping costs, your, your fund has declined from 34 basis points to 18. This is the bottom left hand chart. Uh, so of the total 19 basis point reduction, uh, 16 have come from reduced investment, uh, investment costs. And you can see at the bottom right, uh, the, the change in uh, indexed options as a percentage of indexable assets there. Uh, yours increasing, like I said, from 29 to 44. Uh, similar but less uh, dramatic increases in, in peers 
uh, from 55 to 60 and in the universe from 60 to 66. Uh, just for clarity, when we say as a percentage of indexable assets, uh, we that does not include uh, assets such as stable value funds, which there really is no uh, in a passive uh, equivalent to a, to a stable value fund. Next slide, please. So this, I would say, is is probably the most uh, important page in my presentation. It presents your actual cost against uh, the custom peer based benchmark cost. Uh, the benchmark cost essentially represents uh, what your plan would cost if you had similar costs to your peers. So on this basis, we show you to be 2.5 basis points low cost. Uh, to the peer uh, benchmark of 28.1 basis points. If we look at the table below and the reasons for the difference, I think it makes uh, this position uh, even better actually than the 2.5 uh, headline number. Uh, if you look at the reasons, uh, first it's fees paid for similar options, uh, you're three basis points lower uh, than peers. So what that means is for each of, you know, for example, for all, for your, your uh, US equity options on average, you know, are, are cheaper than, than those of peers and, and similar across your whole lineup reserve, resulting in savings for members. Uh, the next item, participants allocation index versus active options. Uh, like I've said, your, your participants allocation index assets of 44% is lower than peers. Uh, this is causing an excess cost of 3.6 basis points. But this isn't necessarily a bad thing, so long as your active management leads to leads to investment results that are better uh, than the passive uh, equivalents. Uh, so your your members do have the opportunity, perhaps, to uh, reap rewards in excess of of these additional costs. And then we have fees paid for administrative services uh, being lower than those of your peer set by three basis points. Again, this is a direct savings to your members. So really, you know, you've got six basis points of savings relative to uh, your peers that are that are uh, very beneficial for members uh, with the counteracting item being something that they could, uh, you, you know, counteract through, through better results. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a quick explanation before I move into the next, the couple slides after this one, uh, show your relative, your cost and performance position by investment uh, fund as compared to your peers. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how we determine what we call the benchmark cost for your goal maker service. Uh, we do this for all uh, funds that are multi-asset funds to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples and adjusting for any differences that there might be in the overall asset allocation. I'll walk you through quickly the example of how we determine the benchmark cost on a single asset class by using stock US mid small cap as an example. So the second line in the chart, uh, moving from uh, left to right, uh, we start with your holding percentage, which for this asset class is 14%. Uh, of that, 29% is passively invested, 71% is actively invested. Uh, the next two columns over there, uh, columns C and D, which present standard costs. Uh, the standard cost for active is 62 basis points. For index, it's four basis points. Those are determined based on the standalone option costs that are reported as part of our DC survey. So what we do is we will then multiply those standard costs by your allocation to passive and active. So you are 29% passive, so 29% multiplied by four basis points, 71% multiplied by 62 basis points returns the 45 basis point average cost for US small and mid cap. Multiplying that by the 14% allocation gets you a 6.3 basis point overall cost allocation for the fund. Uh, we do that for each of the asset classes that you see there, resulting in a raw benchmark cost of 33.8 basis points. Uh, we then apply a group-based uh, multiplier, uh, which basically normalizes it such that uh, the overall cost for your peer group for their uh, target date funds, uh, based on this methodology, equals that that's actually their actual costs. Uh, so in this case, the multiplier is 0.68. 
uh, which results in a benchmark cost of 23 basis points, which in this case is about 5.1 basis points higher than your actual cost of 17.9 basis points. Uh, with that being said, we can now move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I am going to tell you uh, the important aspects and, and how to read it so that you can do so and, and fully understand what it's saying. Uh, we can see each individual option is listed on uh, to, to the left. At the top are the single asset class funds, followed by the goal maker funds below. Uh, moving from left to right, at first we present cost, uh, so it's your cost versus the benchmark cost for that fund, uh, with the individual asset class benchmark cost being the median for that style of, of fund within the asset class and the goal makers being, as I described uh, below. The cost differential is the difference between your your cost and that of the peers and you can see in almost every case uh, you are uh, low cost uh, compared to peers with just a couple of small exceptions. Uh, the boxes that are next are a visual cue to where you rank uh, relative to peers. Uh, seeing no dark boxes means that you are uh, 10th percentile or below, two squares between 10th and 25th percentile, three squares is within the middle 50% of values, uh, four squares would be 75th to 90%, and five squares would be 90 percentile or above. So for cost, uh, seeing two bars are, are, two dark boxes are for fewer is a good thing. Uh, three boxes is okay. Any more would signal uh, significantly high cost. So again, another visual indication uh, from a cost perspective, your funds are doing very well. Uh, the next uh, area presents net return for 2020. So opposite of cost, you are looking for more dark bars uh, or dark boxes. Uh, three or more dark boxes uh, is, is good. Uh, particularly four or five says that you're in the top uh, quartile uh, and we can see a uh, little bit mixed in in some areas but overall pretty good uh, in in the goal maker areas more importantly uh, would be five-year return unfortunately we don't have five-year returns for your goal maker uh, funds they haven't been around that long uh, for the funds that you have held uh, fairly decent performance in most areas where you are lagging a little bit, you'll notice it's impassive and those differentials are absolutely tiny. It's just reflective of your tracking error being slightly worse uh, than, some of your, than some of your peers. Uh, what's really important to members is net value add, which is the difference between the benchmark of the fund and the actual realized returns. Uh, on the uh, slide, uh, two slides prior, I was mentioning that the additional 3.6 basis point cost uh, due to being more actively invested could be recouped by members through positive returns. And in most funds, this seems to have been the case in 2020. Again, uh, three dark boxes or more is a good result with four or five being exceptional. And, and you can see that's very common, especially in the, uh, in the goal maker uh, service. Uh, the, the final uh, piece, uh, risk for 2020 on the right-hand side, uh, for the multi-asset funds, that is your risk, your asset risk compared to that of peers. In general, you can see that at the short end, uh, you are taking less risk uh, than peers, uh, but at the long, for the longer dated funds, uh, some of them, you're, you, uh, our model show your goal makers to be higher risk. Um, well, at least in the aggressive, which makes sense, uh, moderate is moderate and, and the conservative is low. So the three suites are, are very, uh, are obviously uh, working as, as intended there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a continuation of the prior slide. Uh, so next slide. Uh, very quickly here, uh, this this shows your returns against those of uh, the universe for your target date options. Uh, we have assigned, uh, you know, you don't have uh, traditional target date options, which mention a year. You have rather uh, five-year band horizons. Uh, so just for your benefit, we have assigned them to 
the, uh, the the years, for example, the 21 to 25 year horizons have been uh, assigned to the 2040 for comparison purposes. Next year, I suspect that will change, being uh, moved to the 20 uh, the, the the 2045. Uh, so in general, you can see for 2050, which is the longest data date fund you have, uh, your returns are slightly uh, below median, closer to 25th percentile, uh, similarly below median for the 2040, but then for the 2035 and onward, your results for 2020 were uh, above median and, and for tw the 2025 uh, and 2020 were at or above 90th percentile. Uh, so overall, quite strong. Uh, results in 2020, particularly for the shorter dated funds. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this this shows asset risk uh, compared to that of your peers. And uh, I would like to point out, so, you know, 2050, uh, you had lower returns than that of peers, but you have, we're showing you having lower asset risk. Uh, so, so that would be consistent uh, results. Uh, 2035, 2030, and 2025, uh, we're showing you as having higher asset risk uh, than that of peers. So that is a partial determinant of your higher uh, higher returns. Uh, with 2020 and, and the income funds uh, being a bit of an outlier because uh, you have similar risk to uh, to peers, but but much higher, uh, much better returns. Uh, next slide. Uh, for an overall return basis, uh, you can look at the chart on on the right there. Uh, your participants' average return for 2020 was 14.8%, uh, which is just above median uh, compared to the universe. Uh, for On a five-year basis, your uh, average participant return was 9.8% per annum, which was equal to peers, but slightly lower uh, than the universe average. Uh, part of what brings up the average over the five year for the universe as compared to the peers is the fact that uh, we do have quite a few corporate clients that have an employer stock option and we all know that equities have been a strong uh, returning asset class uh, for that time period. So that is often increased returns within a lot of corporate funds. Uh, next slide. Here we look a little bit, obviously, at why, uh, you know, this is this slide is meant to have explain your returns relative to, to peers in the universe. And the primary determinant of that is uh, how your, your members are invested. Uh, so if we look over the past five years, what have the strongest uh, uh, returning asset classes been? Well, like I said, equity. Uh, U.S. equity has been uh, really strong, has seen really strong returns over this five-year period. Uh, target imbalance uh, has been the second strongest, uh, followed by uh, foreign foreign equity. Uh, so, if we look at your participants' allocation as compared to peers, uh, quite similar when it, but a bit lower when it comes to U.S. stock and and target date imbalance. Uh, with the difference being made up in stable value. So the fact that you were able to uh, see returns as high as peers uh, in that time frame, given the, the difference is quite remarkable and is reflective of, of good uh, investment performance over that time period. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a, a couple quick uh, slides here to finish my remarks. Uh, this shows some high level uh, statistics uh, compared to your, your peers. So, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier on that, that many of the corporate plans in our database are, uh, you know, sole source of retirement income, not the case in, in your plan. So your percentage of eligible employees who participate uh, is 33%, which is very much in line with peers, but a lot lower than what we see in a lot of corporate plans. Um, all of your members are making voluntary contributions and you can see the contribution amounts there are uh, pretty much in line, but a bit lower uh, than, than the peer median. Uh, and that's also reflected in a slightly lower uh, active, uh, our average account balance. Uh, next slide, please. 
And, and my last slide here, I, a quick uh, overview of some of the major services that can be uh, provided to participants. Uh, you do not provide uh, individual financing, financial counseling to members in, in any form. 62% uh, of your peers uh, do. Um, you do offer financial education, both by uh, group meetings and individual meetings, consistent with your peers. Uh, you provide uh, a projection of annual retirement income online, uh, which is done by all your peers as well, um, but you don't do it on, on your participant statements. Uh, and lastly, uh, you have marketing campaigns uh, aimed at increasing employee deferral rates as well as uh, increasing participation uh, by eligible non-participants, uh, which is consistent with uh, what your peers do. Uh, that's the end of my formal remarks. Any questions? Any questions from board members? Okay, thank you very much. Go over with, Okay. Um, I thought it was kind of interesting uh, seeing the percentage comparisons between us and the universe about the issue of indexed plan, index funds that were in their plans. And I noticed that the universe and our peer group were averaging between 60 and 66%. Um, whereas we were about 48%. And this question of indexing versus um, management has been an ongoing conversation and for as long as I've been on this board. And I was wondering if we did a projection, if we set a policy for our management style to be 40% uh, managed versus 60% index, would that drive our cost even lower and our performance figures higher? It and would that definitely drive your costs lower. With respect to performance, uh, we would, well, CM's done a lot of, of research and has found that active management has been able to generally provide returns in excess of the additional costs. So the one exception to that would be in US large cap, uh, which does appear to us to be a very efficient market. Uh, you're already 100% passive in that area within your goal maker options. So uh, returns themselves, if anything, based on, you know, if we look at the last five years where your performance has been quite good on a relative basis, performance would have been lower had you been uh, fully indexed. Okay. Thank you. Michael, uh, this is the treasurer. I have a question. Uh, sure. I carry this book around with me uh, on the pension plan that has a graph that shows uh, our percentile as being one of the lowest in the universe uh, in terms of the cost of the book on teachers and elders system. <clears throat> so in what, with what you presented, there's no graph specific that's uh, similar to that. And the, you've not presented any graph today that's similar to the one that you presented to us on the pension plan, correct? No, that's correct. Yeah, we, we don't we don't show a, a graph that ranks uh, overall costs. So it's probably the reason I did so poorly in school because I thought zero percentile was a good thing. So, uh, so where are we? If if you were to just off the top of your head, if, if we were to visualize a graph like that, uh, it shows on page five that I guess we're thirteen percentile out of our peers. Is that correct? Uh, and no, so that shows there's 13, 13 peers. Your costs are slightly below median, so you're probably about 45th percentile. Uh, but that is, I would, I would say that is a, more of an apples to oranges comparison. What I would direct the attention of the committee to is, is page seven, where we 
we compare your cost to the peer-based benchmark cost, which is more apples to apples, that shows a 2.5 basis point differential. But as I stressed before, the two, uh, the major components uh, being the fees paid for similar options and fees paid for administrative services, both being a 3%, uh, you know, savings relative, I would view that as, you know, a six, your six basis points lower uh, than your, you know, than, than your average peer on a, on an apples to apples basis, which I, I would suspect would put you, you know, probably at least 25th percentile cost wise, like very, very competitive. And one for one percentile is good in this, in this, sometimes that we talk would about be, business. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So, yeah, no. So we're mid pack. Uh, and part of that is because of we're compared to a lot of folks who have a bigger percentage of their money in index funds is a, is some part, right. is a part of that. Okay. That's right. All right. And I just want to go back. Uh, you, there's no need to respond to this, but members on page six, uh, I mean, those graphs uh, truly reflect what, where our discipline and where our focus has been over the last four years uh, with the cost of uh, percentage of plant assets falling in half, investment costs as percentage of plant assets falling in half, and the trend in plant cost nearly falling in half over the last four years. That's why with how we started this meeting with Sam talking about what he talked about, I'm just not sure what, when we have in four years have cut the cost of these things in half, literally, not to mention, not to mention, this wouldn't even include the fee holiday, right? Because that's a participant thing. Right. So we've had three fee holidays out of four years, and then we've cut the cost in half of the last four years. I just, uh, it's just, I mean, credit goes to the staff and this board for having the discipline to focus on this because going back to what Sam said, I'm just not sure what problem they're trying to solve. I just don't know how we could have done better uh, over that period of time. So, a I'm, question? Yes. I, this is Steve. I've got a, a comment and a question to help maybe clarify one of these uh, uh, charts about we were slightly below average on the five return. But if my recollection is correct, our average allocation to the stable value and fixed over the last five years was higher and has been declining, but it's still higher than the average. And that may have contributed to part of that slight performance over five years. Is that Melinda? Yes. Maybe you or others recall if that makes if that is correct. Exactly. Uh, and that's right. shown on, on slide fourteen, actually, and, and would be would be a, a, a factor. And and as uh, Michael said, we don't have stock options inside of our plan, like some of the plans do, that obviously juice their performance. We have a more conservative investment style with the percentage of people that have money in stable value versus our peers. But the things that this board has control over, which are plan costs, and the average investment costs as percentage of plan assets, we do extremely well, so. Any other questions? All right. Thank you, Michael. Well, now Thank we'll go to Thomas to talk about the transition of the stable value fund. Board Mr. Treasurer, members of the board. Uh, Thomas Ray uh, from CLA. Uh, I'm actually uh, the lead partner for the financial statement audit, but I'm happy to be here today uh, to discuss uh, the reconciliation of the stable value fund uh, transfer of assets from Wells Fargo to BNY, uh, which occurred in, I think, this board voted in December uh, to uh, make that tr that transfer, and that transfer was uh, scheduled to occur on April 1st. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, fiduciary roles and responsibilities, 
Uh, obviously, as, as your financial statement auditor, that's an important uh, and best practice in an exercise of your fiduciary roles. But it, a situation like this, again, is, is, a, is a demonstration of uh, this board's uh, prudence in exercising their roles. And, and, and so really, this project was twofold, uh, two objectives. Uh, you can stop on page three if you want. Um, yeah, perfect right there. The objective one is really where I wanted to focus. But again, the, what we did, so all the all the parties involved did their own reconciliations. This was to, to do an unbiased uh, third party reconciliation and work with all those uh, ben, all those investment managers uh, to that to validate the, the reconciliation uh, of those assets. As you might for some of the newer board members, uh, your the stable value plan. Uh, in, in, in terms of the fund lineup is one of the larger um, asset classes. So it's a, it's a big move. And, and, and another thing to point out is while April 1st was a key date, you don't just flip the switch and say, well, these assets were here on April 1st and now they're there, you know, seconds later, minutes later. In fact, uh, while that might be the case for the majority of the assets, uh, a, lot of those, a lot of those securities did transfer on April 1st. Um, any transition like this, um, there's trailing payments, some securities that don't settle uh, for several days, several weeks in, in the ensuing month. And, and that obviously is a challenge again in trying to reconcile the entirety of, the, of, that, tr of that transition and certainly um, was a risk area that we uh, focused on. So really, again, the objectives were twofold. To do that reconciliation, reconcile all those assets either on a April 1st or any trailing payments. And then, of course, if we identified any issues with the reconciliation to report those to the board and uh, assist in kind of quantifying whatever monetary impact there might have been on those errors. So um, really looking at objective one at the top of that page, uh, just what we did is develop that understanding of the timeline that started with uh, discussions with staff and then ultimately transitioned into uh, um, discussions planning with uh, Wells Fargo, BNY Mellon, Mellon and Galliard, uh, obtained all that supporting documentation. Uh, as I said, they all, all three of those parties uh, were, were performing their own independent uh, reconciliations as well. Uh, find all of these securities and assets that weren't transferred. So again, that was one of the key risk areas and confirm the subsequent settlement of each of those. And then reviewed and reconciled the subsequent wire transfers from Wells to uh, BNY, and including the any impact impact of trailing payments, corporate actions that occurred on April first or before after. Um, again, there's a lot of information in this report. Uh, we did our best to kind of write it to a layman's perspective, so the reader can kind of get a feel for for what what happened. Big, this is a big. This was a big move, obviously. Um, objective two was was uh, if we had any issues. So I'll just give you a little color. Um, again, we worked with all the managers. Uh, had no issues. We did do a lot of independence. We even in our financial statement audit, we're auditors, we're accountants. Uh, we use IDEA, so it's data analytics software. So we were able to kind of match up the securities that were reported by, uh, let's say, Wells, and then you matching using matching software to just make sure that all those securities ultimately were received in BNY uh, at some point and settled into that BNY account. And uh, as a, I think uh, the plans themselves uh, were impacted by an error several years ago where there was one security that uh, didn't settle. And as you might imagine that um, once that was identified after the fact, that may have, that certainly has an impact on that daily crediting rate in, in the stable value plan. So again, I'll go back to uh, the exercise of your fiduciary roles and just um, bringing us in to kind of have that unbiased reconciliation and validate uh, the completeness and accuracy of that transaction. And as I said, I'm not going to go through um, a lot of the details, but uh, so those those four of four there's each of those four sub categories of objective one are, are spelled out for the for the board and, and any readers to give you a little more color. And as I said, most importantly, um, we validated that there were no uh, errors. In the in this in the reconciliation and transfer of a, of a stable value fund. 
a question. A few minutes back, perhaps. Any questions? Well, um, go ahead. Go ahead, Steve. No, I just said that was well done and very comprehensive. I have no questions. Thomas, where'd you come in from? Let me see. All right. Happy to be here. The suit still fits. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to be here. What? Happy to be here. My suit still fits. Um, <laughs> Been wearing shorts and just the jacket for several months. Is our rate lower when you only wear shorts? <laughs> it is a paper clip. <laughs> All right, I had to get my, my pants taken out though, so that glam right back up. All right, uh, is that it? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thanks. You used to live in the firm in North Carolina and you wouldn't have to travel. I'd like to. We can arrange that. Sure. A lot of those shorts meetings were uh, at the beach. Okay. Good. Michael, can you top that? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Treasurer. So, first and foremost, Matt, would you? Uh, Mike McCann, Matt's Matt, going to pull your chair up there, or you want whatever you want there. <clears throat> All right. Well, first and foremost, again, uh, Mike McCann, Matt Herman with Prudential. We also have our senior leader, Michael Nolan, here today. Um, such a pleasure to be back in person. I uh, want to spend uh, some time walking through several items today. Uh, first and foremost, like the treasurer said at the beginning, uh, congratulations on the NAGDA awards. Uh, just for a little more context, believe it or not, dating back to 2013, uh, the North Carolina plans have now won 12 NAGDA awards. Um, so just an incredible um, congratulations to you and your staff for, for all, all of the work over the years for your participants. Uh, secondly, uh, just a sincere thank you for the, uh, the contract extension. Uh, our commitment and our focus uh, remain the same, is stronger than it ever has been. Um, for, for today's update, what I'd like to do is provide an update on the announced sale of Prudential Retirement's full service business to Empower. After that, I'd like to share a few of the uh, Q1 board reports uh, metrics, key metrics. I should say Q2 board report, sorry about that. And then uh, lastly, uh, Matt Herman then will provide an update on retirement education team for 18 dedicated reps in the field and the uh, key themes that we're seeing there. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, what was announced in terms of, of the sale? So Empower Retirement and Prudential have entered into a definitive agreement for Empower to acquire Prudential's full service retirement business, uh, which includes uh, the DC plans, the defined contribution plans, from, uh, of which the state of North Carolina supplemental plans are part. Um, Empower has also stated their intention to preserve select full service solutions such as Goldmaker, which is great, um, as well as caring for uh, the key personnel that work on your program. So all, all key personnel is uh, expected to get uh, offered employment with Empower. And I know Jeff, you and I have talked about that and we should be able to circle back sometime in early October to confirm, confirm that for you. Uh, the transaction is expected to close in the first quarter of 2022, uh, subject, of course, to all the regulatory approvals and the customary closing provisions. Uh, so I thought, thought next I'd just share just a little bit about, about uh, Empower. Empower Retirement is currently the second largest retirement service provider in the United States, and they're sing singularly focused on retirement. Uh, with expertise really across all plans, company sizes, and market segments. Um, they are the leader in the government retirement plan space. They currently have 24 state plan relationships today. After this sale is completed, they'll have 30 state plan relationships. Uh, during the next few months, what can you expect from uh, Prudential? Um, our commitment 
remains the same to you and we will ensure business continuity and frequent communications. Between now and the close, you can expect absolute business as usual. Um, no changes at all to the way that we interact with you on a day in and day out basis and the same dedicated service that you come to rely on. In addition, I know several staff members have been attending the, uh, the uh, scheduled webcasts that we've been doing between uh, Empower's leadership team and Prudential's leadership team. Uh, Michael has been on those webcasts and we will continue to do so. And, and uh, we'll keep you updated um, as we get closer to that close date in, in Q1. Uh, any questions? I want to pause there to see if there's any, any further questions on, on the announcement. By the way, we have uh, coffee in the next room if you might need some coffee to get through. Okay. All right. So, sh shifting to the update for Q1. Um, I'm going to spend my time on, on just a couple of the goal summary pages. If we first want to go to page five of the deck, we have a few slides here that really give you a perspective of how we're trending across our key metrics on, on a rolling 13 month basis that I want to review on page five and page six. Uh, the first one is um, a chart that shows contributions versus distributions. Kind of gives you a, a quick high level overview of net flows. Um, it had been at the last quarterly meeting, um, contributions and distributions have kind of been in line. We've seen a slight uptick here over the past couple of months where distributions are back to where, are trending back to where they had historically been about outpacing contributions. Now, not as much as they were earlier in the year, um, but um, we do have a, a slight negative net flow. In terms of average participant balance, we continue to exceed an all-time high there. Active participation rate remains well ahead of goal, um, comfortably sitting above 33.5%. Uh, and then average active employee deferral, that average well ahead of goal. Um, you know, a couple years ago, we celebrated crossing the $200 per month for the first time in history. We've just kept chugging along. We're, we're now, you know, we just crossed 225 for the first time ever in terms of the, the average employee deferral. On page six, total unique participants with a balance. This only counts for participants once. So if they're in more than one plan, they're only counted once. So we continue to trend on an upward slope there. Um, just, just for awareness, as some of you may not know, we have about 30,000 participants that are in more than one of your plans right now. So they might be in the 401k and 457. In terms of total enrollments, month by month enrollments, uh, we continue to, uh, to trend nicely there. Um, Matt's gonna get into a little bit more detail and I don't wanna put pressure on Matt and his team, but if you remember how we fell off when we got right into the pandemic, we're almost getting close to where we were pre-pandemic. Um, so kudos to Matt and his team for just, you know, having to literally, you know, pivot on the spot and go to 100% virtual and how we've, we've come through that work. The goalmaker participation rate remains very strong and steady. And then the number of new loans, um, we have been kind of trending downward for the past five or six months. That's starting to, to move slightly back up uh, to where, where it had historically. Uh, and then, and then on page seven, um, our our goal summary slide. You can see that that broken out into a little bit more detail. Um, the reason that we always have these on our goal summary slide: the average monthly contribution rate, the active participation rate, and then the goal maker usage among all members are um, performance guarantees that you guys have put into our contract. We just want to make sure that we're reporting that we're hitting all of those. Um, in addition to that, we also then report out on uh, what we're doing at the employer level in terms of um, employer outreach. We have so far this year, 11 new employer adoptions of the program, um, six additional contribution accelerator adoptions, and then 11 employers have either added or enhanced their employer contribution. 
Um, and then we have detail on, I won't get into it, but in detail on page 54 to 57 of who those employers are in case you as board members happen to um, have outreaches with any of those sub plans, you can be sure to thank them. Um, one, one last thing that I would share is the fact um, I touched, I touched about the 11 uh, employers that have either started or enhanced their contribution, their employer contributions. We currently have about a, uh, approximately 520 employers that make some type of an employer contribution. Uh, that is very meaningful. Uh, just to give you perspective in, in terms of the overall employer contributions on a monthly basis, that makes up about 33% of the total incoming um, flow into participants accounts. About 33% of that is employer contributions. Uh, so with that, um, unless there's questions for me, what I'd like to do is now pivot and hand it over to Matt to really uh, share some perspective for the interactions with your participants over the last quarter. Great. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, Trevor, uh, rest of the board, uh, members of staff. It is a pleasure to be with you today. To Mike's point, I think um, it's been probably 18 months since we've been in this meeting room. So it's just great to be face to face to be with those virtually. Um, I'm going to spend probably most of my time on slide 52. Um, before that, uh, because it's been a while, we've talked in the other quarter about the impacts of the pandemic, um, the headwinds that we face, that employers and employees face. And I went back, March was the, the month where everything really picked up as far as the pandemic. And April was our first full month of being virtual in April 2020. So from April 1st to June 30th of this year, it's 15 months. I went back to my LinkedIn on our data. Uh, a couple numbers I wanted to share with you. Um, 25,775 one-on-one, 1,625 group meetings, um, 65,000 employees that we've engaged since April, some form of education live, not pre-recorded. These are live group meetings or one-on-ones. 4,200 employer meetings and over 20,000 employees. Over those last 15 months, and all of this has been done virtually. And I think uh, it's a testament to this board, to this program, to staff, and to our employers. Uh, we faced a lot of headwinds, but I think in spite of that, we've seen a lot of good progress. Um, and it comes through in the data, and I'll share some information here about this year and some recent updates. But it also comes in the story when you start to dig into the data and you actually participate in these meetings, the one on ones we're having. Uh, it shows up in the partnerships that we have. Not just with employers, but even with staff. You know, Vicki Roberts and her team, you know, Tom's team is doing the pension education. We're partnering there. We've done 90 retirement planning conferences over the last 15 months in partnership with Vicki's team with 7,000 attendees live in those sessions. Uh, it comes through in the group meetings. We're spending a lot of time focusing on the unique needs of law enforcement officers, firefighters, teachers. Two weeks ago, we did a special session, it's a statewide education session for teachers. We opened that up to all 115 schools. We had a thousand teachers registered for this event. So we're spending a lot of time focusing on the unique needs of different groups. Uh, and it also comes in through the numbers when we look at our employer engagement. Not only are we doing meetings with them, we're also doing new ways, new webinars, new education sessions. We started a new series this year. We've done three of them now called our employer education webinars. Uh, we did another one two weeks ago. We had 325 employers register and participate from our thousands of employers. So we're seeing really good progress, not just in the numbers, but we're seeing people embrace and adopt and tap into the resources that we make available. And I think it's also being recognized nationally to Mike's point to echo uh, Mr. Treasurer, your comments at the beginning, NAGDA is recognizing that too. Now we're getting not just one, but two awards that recognize the technology work that's been done in this program over the last year, uh, as well as the engagement, like specifically in October of 2020, with National Save for Retirement Month, which we saw some tremendous things. So thank you for your partnership. Uh, um, I'll draw your attention a limited time and a half to page 52. You can see a breakout of the second quarter, April, May, June, our group meetings, our individual meetings, our employer meetings, uh, and the roll for the quarter. If you look at the bottom page, bottom of that page, comparison with the first quarter of the second quarter. Last year was a big event. April was a tremendous hit. We all experienced it. We've seen steady increase. In October last year, we learned a tremendous amount. 
Uh, and thanks again to staff, to Christy Fairley for the creativity that you brought. We've applied those things. And I think when we hit this year, we started to hit our stride. We're seeing that consistency when you look across the first quarter and the second quarter with our engagement. But we are seeing increases as well, um, specifically group meetings. We had 353 group meetings in the first quarter. We've seen a 20% increase in the second quarter with 426. And that was by design. We want to continue to make access to education there for everyone. So we're finding creative ways to engage, not just with our virtual, visual, virtual platforms, but even with our content, doing more sessions on market volatility, uh, focusing on the needs of unique employers. We've done sessions on how to navigate the website, how to use the mobile app, how to use the tools that we make available. There's some really powerful things out there. We're trying to connect people to that. We also have that accessibility top of mind. You know, we recognize there are some folks that English may not be their first language. So we're doing sessions in Spanish. Uh, we've done sessions with DHHS focused on those that may be deaf or blind, some, some form of hearing or visual impairment. So thinking creatively about how we can make sure we are serving the needs of everyone. Um, and that's top of mind. Focusing on specific groups. You know, Mr. Treasurer, you've shared in the past that the challenges and the stress that comes as a retiree is huge. It's one of the most stressful times in someone's life. We recognize that we're doing things for the retiree population as well. In addition to the 90 sessions we've done with Mickey's team, we also do supplemental retiree education sessions just about this plan. We've done 10 of those over the last year. We're doing them monthly now. We've had 6,000 retirees register and participate in those sessions. Uh, and we're also doing outbound calls. So every month we uh, know the list of the folks that are retiring. We are proactively calling them to the individual level just to make them aware that we're there for them, that we know this is a stressful time, that they may be faced with decisions. We've got 3,200 outreach calls to retirees, and that's something we continue to do. We get really good feedback on that. So we're seeing the progress with the engagement. Uh, we're seeing really good feedback. I think you can see that in 52, and we're seeing actions taken by employees and employers. Page 53, 54, 55, I won't go through the details there, but I'll share a couple of key stats with you. Uh, year to date, we have eight, had, through Q2, 8,786 enrollments. It's 3% higher year over year. We're also up 7% with contribution increases. So, still a lot of work for us to do. There's a lot of people out there that need help, but we're seeing folks take action. You saw that in some of the, the data points that Mike shared. We're also seeing employers taking action with the employers that have set up plans. We've had 11, 11 of those through Q2. Employer contribution programs that are added or enhanced which is a tremendously important thing. It's a really big driver of engagement and, uh, and influence for folks, making them aware of these valuable benefits. And then the optional features that are available, uh, moving from dollar-based contributions to percentage-based, using contribution accelerator. These are natural, kind of more organic ways for people to drive retirement savings. So the more we can bring attention to those optional features to the employers and get them to embrace and adopt that, that's only going to do do more to help folks and drive retirement readiness overall. So a lot of good progress, but a lot of work to do. You know, as we finish up Q3 and we move into Q4, some things that are top of mind for us are those partnerships with employers, which we've talked about a lot. We need their help, especially now in the virtual environment, to make sure employees are aware of us as a team, resources that we make available on the website, connecting to registration information for the meetings we offer, um, sharing communications. We've also rolled out new technology. We are now doing more of our enrollments in a non-paper-based manner. We've enhanced our online enrollment capability. This year, uh, we have 20% of our enrollments now that are happening via that enhanced technology. A lot of those are facilitated by our team. So we're using that technology, but we're bringing kind of a human education. Um, the other thing that's big for us is October 2021. Uh, we've talked about the awards for last year, but October is quickly approaching. So we're starting to gear up for this next National uh, Retirement Security Month, setting up meetings, getting prepared, uh, and we're very optimistic we'll see even more individual this year, hopefully, than last year. Um, so a lot of work to do, a lot of learnings that we want to apply. And it's really taking the technology and the design, but also bringing the human element to that. You know, we are participant focused. That's top of mind for us. Again. You know, I wanted to end and I'll share a story that recently one of the team members shared with me, Kelly Martindale, who's actually our longest tenured counselor on the team. She's been with this program for probably 25 years in an education role. 
and she reached out. She shared the story of a woman who worked in the county 22 years, uh, was hearing rumblings that there may be job cuts, job eliminations. So it was creating a lot of anxiety, um, creating a lot of stress, fear of the unknown. So she reached out to Kelly. She worked with Kelly for years, and they just didn't encounter a virtual one on one. And Kelly walked her through the history of her account, the fact that she enrolled in the 401 k that she then took the time later to enroll in the 457, that she's then increased her contributions, and she's gotten uh, salary increases and paid off bills. And that diligence has done a lot for her. Well, Kelly didn't necessarily alleviate uh, all the stress and the anxiety that comes with the job related items. And she brought peace of mind to that participant because this individual had accumulated nearly a million dollars across the floor when he had 457. And uh, that brings peace of mind to people. And at the end of the day, that's the criticality of these roles. The 18 folks we have out there, many of which have been with this program for 20 plus years, the relationships they have, their experience, their knowledge, it's critical. We're here to help people, not just in retirement, but at the beginning, middle, and end stages, and even through retirement. And uh, the other thing Kelly shared is what makes this job so rewarding. Uh, it's a noble profession, and we're just honored to be a partner of yours and to be able to do this work every day. So thank you for your support. Any questions? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. I just wanted to applaud you guys. I've joined some of of the uh, of the uh, sessions that you have done, and you know, as you know, one of our goal is to reduce the leakage from the plan. And you guys do a very good job of making sure that folks are aware that that they can leave their money in the plan, and that the goal maker service not only goes up to retirement but through retirement. So, thank you for for, for staying on point with that message. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. This is a first in person presentation you made in a while. First one since uh, being with you guys on February 27th of 2020. Is that why Michael second. was back here doing Namaste? <laughs> Praying. It's been a long time. <laughs> Thank you for the best job of performance. You respect her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, welcome. Thank you. And uh, uh, the firm that is acquiring Prudential is called Empower. And who are they? Is that owned by Venture Capitals? No, their their parent company is a Great West Life Co. Maybe I'm getting confused because there's 122 billion upstairs here in the pension plan. And I think we're part of a uh, landmark or part of a venture capital group that actually owns Great West that owns Empower. So we, okay. we may be an investor in that. Okay. I'm okay. not sure because lots of things are moving around these days with the firms being acquired and bought out. So wouldn't want to go on the record. But always a chance that we're that the pension plan upstairs owns a piece of the vendors that are in front of us. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, we're behind schedule. Uh, are you sure everybody okay? Would you continue to roll? Hey, hello. Can everybody hear me? Hello? Yes, you, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Just want to confirm that you, everyone can hear me. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, good morning, Mr. Treasurer, board members, staff, and guests. Uh, thank you for allowing me to present today. This is Paul Langenke, uh, the your client relationship manager here at Galliard. Uh, we can start on page one uh, under section one. There we go. And just want to give some highlights to the progress made in the sale of Wells Fargo Asset Management, which Galliard is a wholly owned subsidiary of. And a few quick hits include uh, on February 23rd this year, uh, just to refresh, the, there was an agreement for the sale of Wells Fargo Asset Management from Wells Fargo, the bank, to a consortium of two private equity firms, uh, those being GECR out of Chicago and Reverence Capital out of New York. Uh, Wells Fargo, the bank, will still have a 9.9% non-voting passive stake, primarily made because of uh, Wells Fargo's distribution channels. Uh, the deal is valued at about $2.1 billion, 
should close in the in the coming months, but the expectation is uh, by the end of the year. Uh, recently, on the 26th of July, uh, Wells Fargo Asset Management was renamed All Spring Global Investments, and this name will be used at the close of the sale. Also in the name announcement was the news item that the current CEO of the Wells Fargo Asset Management, Nico Marai, has decided to retire at the close of the deal. And this was mostly due to personal reasons. Uh, this was not in the cards from the beginning of the sale process and is recent news. Uh, really, this comes down to personal decisions on his part, which centered around COVID, his old appearance, uh, not doing so well, and they reside in South Africa, again, really due to personal decisions. Uh, with with that news item also came the, the other item that Joe Sullivan uh, will be taking over, and uh, he's uh, currently the, the chairman of the board of All Springs, so now he will also become the CEO. Um, and Joe has, Joe has let us know that there's no change in the growth trajectory from what Nico has previously outlined. Gallery continues on doing what it does well in stable value and fixed income, so no changes there. Uh, from from Galliard's standpoint, this is good news. We do like Joe. He is a Minnesota guy and has been to Minnesota and our offices a few times and, and has a home here. So he has been in regular contact with Mike Norman, Andrew Owen, and Galliard in, in particular. So. You know, he is very involved in many of the work stream and is dialed into our business. Uh, you know, Joe's hope with all of the firm is to look at all the different opportunity sets and see what makes sense, uh, you know, in terms of meaning from fixed income skill sets and where does it make sense to have opportunities for Galliard on top of that. We would expect uh, to see more discussions have, as we have done since 2019 with uh, Wells Fargo Asset Management. Uh, and the product development side and see what makes sense for Gallery going forward there. And, and what I'm getting at is, is new opportunities and retirement income products and, you know, and including possibly stable value and target date funds and things like that. Uh, the CIT, uh, the Commingle Trust uh, trustee business is separate from the sale of Wells Fargo Asset Management. Uh, the plan names will not be changing until a new successor trustee is chosen. And this really goes to our our flagship uh, Stable Valley Commingle Fund, which is called the Wells Fargo Stable Return Fund. Um, until we get a new trustee for the Commingle Trust business, this name will remain in place. And again, that, that'll probably happen after the deal uh, with the two private equity firms closes. Finally, Galliard's branding uh, and name will remain. Uh, one small change that'll happen is that Galliard Capital Management Inc will change to Gallery Capital Management LLC. Um, so small change there. Uh, finally, consent letters uh, have been received by 95% of our clients, uh, you know, and, and we will have additional information, as I mentioned, about the, the trustee uh, change for the collective funds uh, later this year. Uh, does the board or staff have any questions regarding the, the sale updates? Proceed. Okay, so moving on to the next page on who we are. Uh, you know, as you see in the left hand column, our assets under management were about 92.5 billion. Um, as we've been seeing some participants reallocate away from stable value, as our assets under management at the end of the year was roughly 95.4 billion. Uh, put this in perspective, our all time high assets under management uh, were last October, those are about 97.4 billion. Uh, so when we take a look at what the 92.5 billion represents, 75.5 billion is in stable value assets, and that represents roughly 80 percent, 82 percent of our total, with the remaining 18 percent uh, representing our standalone high-quality fixed income mandates. Uh, you know, mainly in the short to intermediate duration ranges. Uh, we did see a bump in assets in July as we recorded new assets from a, uh, a few new wins. And our assets as of uh, July 31st were 93.2 billion. So uh, nice to see that. Uh, 80 plus stable value separate accounts, which North Carolina is a part of. Uh, we have 100 employees on staff, which I like to which I like to point out that you know while there are other asset managers might be laying off employees or consolidating their operations, Galliard is growing and expanding. Uh, and just so far this year, we've had a handful of folks leave. 
but have since found replacements. And these are mostly in the back office, uh, in technology operations, whatnot. Currently, you know, we are actually looking for two new job positions. And this will be a net addition, not a replacement, created to assist in the new business development efforts for us. Uh, you know, and we are definitely looking for candidates. So if anybody knows uh, some good ones, please send them my way. Um, you know, in the middle column, we have 205 institutional clients. 87% of them have been with us for at least five years, which includes North Carolina. And four, 46 of them have worked with Gallery for over 15 years, which shows our long tenured relationship. Hey, Paul, can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Uh, we have an employment crisis in North Carolina, so I don't want you recruiting people out of North Carolina. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Of workers. Uh, okay. Secondly, we're trying to make up some time. So anything okay. that's sort of five months to the obvious, we'll just... Uh, if you can speed over that, that'd be helpful. Yeah, yeah, okay. So really, you know, I'd like to just take a second of your time to just go over, uh, you know, the before I go over the position results of the second quarter, I want to speak briefly about the Prudential sale of their record keeping business in power and how it affects North Carolina Stable Value Fund. Uh, it is our understanding that the wraps with clients who are record kept at Prudential may be part of the deal. And we are, we are working with Prudential right now to understand impacts and options. Ultimately, we would like to retain the Prudential wraps and are working toward that goal while keeping in mind that Galliard has the ability to reassess wrap contracts at any time to assure that they meet our preferred standards. So we have been in contact with Callan, North Carolina staff and Prudential regarding this news. And in terms of Prudential's role right now, as you know, Prudential is the current record keeper and they're also the wrap provider and underlying fixed income manager within the North Carolina stable value portfolio. Uh, our contact at Prudential's institutional stable value group uh, notified us that uh, the Prudential synthetic GICs held within accounts on Prue's record keeping platform, which includes North Carolina, were considered part of the sale of Prudential's full service record keeping business. Thus, per the terms of the deal, these contracts would ultimately be transferred to Great West. Um, but this was not the case with clients that had Prudential as solely a wrapper and not both, you know, and not both a wrapper and record keeper like North Carolina. Uh, the deal is supposed to close at the end of first quarter of next year, and we've had some lead time to work on an amenable solution. Again, we have asked Prudential what will be required of us in order to redocument these contracts to remain with Prudential post-close, and we're going to work, continue to work with Prudential to do so. Uh, obviously, we prefer to continue to use Prudential as a wrapper, and again, they are working with us to resolve uh, this issue as seamless as possible. So. Just want to let you know that we are on top of that, and uh, you know, behind the scenes, we will get this uh, get this sorted out. Any questions on the Empower sale? Okay, so uh, moving to page three, uh, you know, this this is the snapshot as of June thirtieth for the portfolio, um, and again, consistent expected statistics. Uh, assets in the plan are about 2.38 billion uh, as of June 30th. Um, they grew roughly 7.7 .7 million since last quarter. Uh, you know, mostly the, the the growth came from the net interest earnings, as there was a you know 2.6 million coming from outflows, which pretty negligible. So, you know, uh, that being said, the statistics on the lower left hand side of the page, uh, you know. Average book value wrap financial strength ratings haven't changed, remain strong at A, A plus. Underlying quality of the bonds, strong at double A. Number of contract issuers, same at five. The uh, net blended yield or crediting rate did dip some over the quarter by roughly uh, 32 basis points, which again would be expected as these numbers follow the uh, direction of prevailing interest rates. The underlying yields also declined uh, from the quarter from 1.01 to 93 basis points. Uh, while the 93 appears to be a small number, again, the 91-day T-bill or money market funds were yielding about five basis points. So definitely a stronger yield there. Uh, duration, pretty consistent with last quarter. Um, you know, in the market book, uh, while market yields have, you know, fallen dramatically during 2020, blended, blended yield or crediting rate will over the time follow direction of interest rate. So we'll, we'll see that, that number move lower, all else being equal in the coming quarters. But really what helps the stable value fund and its participants is that strong market to book ratio. And that will help 
uh, you know, mitigate the impact in the fall of yield. So that 3.3 per six, 36 percent gain will be amortized over the uh, over the duration of the fund to about 1.05 percent per year. So, you know, that being said, uh, you know, great numbers there. You know, it's doing it exactly what we expected it to do. Um, you know, if we if we want to flip ahead really quick, we'll go to uh, page six in in terms of time. And you know, just uh, really quick, uh, you know, the these show the historical characteristics of the last nine quarters. Again, we're seeing the trend that I I mentioned before. Uh, again, you know, the the blended yield is coming down, but that 103.36 market book will help mitigate that decline. So again, uh, nothing on this page of the historical metrics is out of line with the interest rate environment that we're in. Um, you know, if we take uh, a quick look at the next page. Uh, this is the current book value wrapper allocations as of 630. Um, and, you know, as mentioned, you know, they made pretty consistent. Uh, again, you know, they're all two notches higher than our lowest minimum allowable weighted average rating, the A minus. Um, while we didn't see any fee reductions over the second quarter, over the first quarter, we did see wrap reductions and three wrappers, and that was AGL, MetLife, and Nationwide. Um, again, you know, while we have seen fees coming down, I would guess that 15 basis points will be the floor for now as none of our 10 RAP providers that, that Galliard has a preference for has gone lower than 15 basis points. Um, and on page 11, we, we highlight the fees charged uh, to the stable value fund. And again, you know, the, the good message to share here is that they, they have remained consistent with the la last quarter with no change to the exact 10th of a basis point. So put it in perspective, your date, um, you know, as of the end of last year, they dropped by a tune of roughly 2% or a half basis point uh, when, we, when we take out the uh, 2.5 uh, overlay uh, North Carolina administrative fee. So, uh, you know, the main source of this reduction, again, was from the three wrap fees that we got in the first quarter. So uh, overall, a good story uh, to say. Um, really quick, if we see page 13, we kind of see the, the, the rolled up total portfolio statistics uh, for, the, for the fund and really no material change over the quarter. The external manager allocation on the left-hand column has remained pretty consistent at 50%. A uh, high level message here is that the fund is positioned a little bit more conservatively than last quarter as treasuries have inched up in allocation, but we are still actively looking for relative value in the spread sectors as spreads have been pretty tight in 21. Um, pages 14 and 15, general theme on performance. On if we look at page 14, um, these are the underlying managers that make up the st stable value portfol portfolio and these are their market value performance. Uh, again, on page 14, uh, you know, the performance for the second quarter was was mixed with some managers slightly outperforming their benchmark and some slightly underperforming. That being said, all the underlying strategies outperform their benchmarks over all longer time periods measured on this page, specifically three, five, and since inception columns. Uh, over the quarter, Galliot has managed, you know, Galliot managed underlying uh, portfolios have outperformed their respective benchmarks. Among Galliot and the other external managers, overweight to spread sectors really drove overall returns as they generally outpace U.S. Treasuries with similar durations. Uh, uh, really broadly, overweight to taxable munis, corporate bonds, consumer asset-backed securities, uh, SBA securitizations and agency residential mortgage-backed securities all added to performance. Per positioning uh, with a modest overweight to intermediate maturities proved beneficial as did an allocation to tips. However, you know, one manager, Jenison, uh, per positioning detracted, um, you know, also, you know, for, for that is specifically in the second quarter, uh, you know, they just, they, they uh, have a front end uh, steepening position where the, the yield curve flattened over the quarters. So that being said, they, they have really done well over long time periods and we have no issues with them. So again, uh, for the externally managed portfolios, while returns varies, a general overweight to corporate taxable municipal sectors drove uh, positive returns. Uh, so with that, you know, in time, with uh, all things being with time, 
Uh, the only other item I wanted to mention on this page is that we found out yesterday that TCW, who is one of your uh, fixed income asset managers, uh, notified us that Tad Ravel, uh, who is one of the four generalist portfolio managers of the fixed income team um, and is the fixed income CIO at TCW, will be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, you know, the people remaining, Lard Landman, Steve Kane, and Brian Whalen, will continue as generalist portfolio managers. Uh, with Stephen Kane and Brian Whelan named as co-CIOs, and this will happen at the end of September. Uh, we recognize that this is a meaningful retirement. However, we believe that TCW has solid continuity in place, and we do not expect any material changes to TCW's investment philosophy or process as a result of the retirement. Uh, we will closely be monitoring the transition. We'll discuss the retirement in more detail at our, our next external manager oversight working group meeting. So, Please let me know if you have any questions on this in the meantime. And that's uh, that's about all the the high level information I have for the for the state. And I can answer any questions if you have any at this time. Any questions? Thank you, Paul. Okay, thank you. And uh, I would just say that I think I heard through your comments uh, that. You're in some high-level negotiations uh, with some other folks who may be in the room or on the on the phone, and just uh, just make sure that that uh, you don't get too far out in front of the staff here, and, and it's better to disclose uh, how those negotiations are going, rather rather than springing it on us that they didn't go so well at all. So, just uh, we're big on disclosure here. We're not too big on having to discover things in the last minute. So thank you. Absolutely, Mr. Treasurer. We will definitely be in, in touch with, with staff and uh, regarding any news items that we have. Okay. Thank Elizabeth you. and Weston are next from Cal. Good morning, everyone. This is Elizabeth speaking from Cal and I'm joined by Weston Lewis. Um, certainly want to echo the other comments. It's great to see so many of you in person and to be back back live with many of you and so great to talk to everybody else who's joining us by phone. Um, I recognize we're short on time, so we will keep our comments a little bit brief. Uh, we have two agenda items to share with you all today. We have our regular quarterly performance review and also we have our deep dive on stable value that we provide once a year. Um, so I do want to remind everybody, and for some of you this may be new, um, I say I'm keeping our comments brief, but I just want to reassure everybody that due diligence is very deep and ongoing behind the scenes. So we share with the board a comprehensive overview of everything happening with the plan. We give a, a bigger deep dive that goes into every detail of every manager that we review with Lauren and her team. Um, we go through that once a quarter. Our equity and fixed income specialist will be joining us for a call next week. And then as things come up in between, as recently as yesterday, talking about the TCW development that Paul just shared. Um, so always ongoing. So even though we're keeping the comments brief today, please rest assured that we are uh, not putting towards the actual diligence process. So I'll start on the next page. I'm going to keep the capital market environment very, oh, sorry, one more page. Um, keep it very brief, just to set the stage for performance of the options within the plan. Uh, so within the U.S. equity markets, we continue to see positive results for the quarter and for the year. So keep in mind the year rolls off the first half of 2020. So looking at this, you would have absolutely no idea that we're in the midst of a pandemic and saw a huge uh, decline last April. Uh, so positive returns. We've seen over the last year some reversals in style leadership and cap leadership. So after many years of large cap and growth within the markets, in the fourth quarter of 2020 and first quarter of 21, we saw value come back into favor. We saw small caps performing quite well. Uh, in the last quarter, we saw a little bit of a reversal of that with growth coming back, with, with uh, larger cap coming back. So again, that speaks really highly to how well you all have diversified the options. So participants don't see all of the underlying, they just see the broadly diversified option and those have all performed well and are navigating well these changes that are happening underneath and those with passive options get the market exposure. Um, within small cap, uh, you've probably seen 
news. There's been a lot of news. Um, meme stocks have really been driving small cap returns. So things like GameStop, um, AMC theaters, uh, people trading their Robin Hood accounts have had a very big impact. So when we look at the small cap returns, I'll speak a little bit more about how that's been impacting performance, both for the index and for your active managers. Um, on the next page with international equity markets, again, good positive returns, a little bit behind those within the U.S. Um, small cap has been added in here. We saw the riskier frontier markets performing well in the quarter. Emerging markets have done well over the year. Fixed income is on the next page. So a good comeback in the quarter. So over the year, fixed income represented by the Barclays aggregate is a little bit negative. So down about 0.3% for the year, uh, but a good recovery in first quarter up about 1.8%. So just to give, again, broadly speaking, what participants are seeing are good positive market performance across the board. Um, on page, we go to the stock lights. On page six. One more. Perfect. Um, so here we have a lot of detail in the underlying managers. What you're not seeing is a high level. So if you look at the rolling three-year periods for the high-level options, again thinking about the participant experience, what the participant sees, they see large cap, they see small cap. All of their passive managers are performing in line with their benchmarks, just like we expect them to do. And with the active options on those rolling three-year periods, the majority are outperforming their benchmarks. So U.S. large cap international equity, fixed income, stable value, all of those are ahead of their benchmarks on all of those rolling three-year periods. Small cap is a little bit behind, but again, as the board may recall, you've taken some steps to modify the structure and the arrangement within that, so we feel comfortable with the new structure going forward, and we'll have to live with those three-year numbers as, as just for a little bit longer as we go forward. So high level, everything's working well. Participants are being well served on a return basis, a fee basis, a risk adjusted basis, just across the board, all metrics, things are going well. And we don't have any recommended changes, but we do have a few updates that we'll want to share with you. Um, and I'm just going to stick to the really big ones. We have a lot of, again, a lot of detail for those that are interested in reading. But if we could go ahead to page eight, please. And this is the stoplight that Callum prepared. So this is a holistic look looking at the organizations, looking at teams performance short-term, long-term, and we often use the phrase in line with expectations. So we recognize there are different market environments where some managers we expect them to do well, and we recognize that sometimes they won't. So we're really looking for consistency. Are they doing what we hired them to do? Uh, primarily, yes. And then actually, let's go, sorry, one more page to page nine. Um, so I will mention Wedge Capital, and we'll look at their returns in a moment. Uh, but that's one manager who is on the watch list. We did a deep dive on them last quarter, um, and the board reaffirmed confidence and conviction in them going forward, but we do continue to watch them very closely. Um, they have come back pretty nicely and are having a good um, a good year overall. We got another yesterday, so that's one we continue to watch closely, but as value has gradually been coming back in favor, which is performance has been roughly in line with expectations. Um, so still watching them closely, but we don't have any recommended changes. We, uh, again, support keeping them on watch as we continue to monitor performance going forward. On the next page, Mondrian is the other manager who's on the watch list. This is international value. So they are 50% of the international equity option. Um, again, here, performance has been roughly in line. So when value has been coming back, they've been mostly participating. Um, and so continuing to watch them, again, keeping an eye on how they do from the value perspective. Keep in mind, we benchmark them. The, the IPS benchmarks them to the broad international benchmark. When we look at them versus the international value benchmark, the results are a little bit more favorable and more in line with what we might expect. So supportive of keeping them on watch, uh, but also supportive of, of keeping them in the and we do, we do feel like they're a good complement, a good balance to Bailey Gifford. Uh, and then Paul gave most of our other update. Uh, so DCW, um, as Paul mentioned, Ted Revelle retiring. We just got this news earlier this week. We've already had a conversation with our main point of contact at DCW. Um, our team has a call with Laird Landman tomorrow. So our plan is to talk to each of the individuals, 
We'll also talk to folks, not just the, the key portfolio managers, but we'll talk to others throughout the organization to really get as much information as we can and circle that holistically to see if there are any other issues um, within TCW that we need to be aware of or concerned about. Um, we, I would echo Gallier's sentiments that it is a very deep team, very experienced, a number of professionals. There's not one person really driving results. So we're very comfortable monitoring the situation. We don't think that there's any need to make any changes. We wouldn't recommend engaging a search at this point. Um, so we'd ask that, and I, and I don't even think we need to put them on the watch list at this point. We just found out about this. So we would recommend allowing us to take a little bit of time again to gather as much information as we can and come back with more rest assured that we're in close contact. Lauren joined our call yesterday. Um, so if anything changes, we're going to be really quick to move uh, and let you know about that. We're Again, as Mr. Treasurer said, we're, we share that commitment to transparency. So if we learn anything, we're not going to wait till the board meeting. We're going to bring it up right away. But at the moment, uh, we don't see any need to take action or make any changes. So I'll just highlight two other things before we switch over to stable value. So if we can move to page 14, please. And what we're about to look at here is just a summary of how assets are allocated throughout the plan. And I only bring this up because it ties into the CEM report and a few of the questions that were asked about stable value. So I just wanted to reiterate, stable value is an active manager. So I think we kind of forget about that. We talk about active management, we think about Sands and Hotchkiss and Wiley and our equity folks and our international folks. Um, but stable value does fall into the active space. So that is a big driver of the, the weight to active management. And some of this is participants allocating themselves. Some of this is coming into exposure through the goal maker allocations. But at 15%, that's the largest single active manager that we have exposure to. Um, it's 15% of, of the plan and, and almost 25% of the active allocation is with stable value. So just wanted to Kind of reiterate and put some numbers around the questions that were asked and, and show where that fits into the overall plan allocation. Um, so it's the single largest active, and then within that large cap core equity fund, keep in mind too, of that 15.75%, we do have roughly a quarter of that is passive. So we do still have passive within the large cap active option. Um, so just wanted to put some context there. It's not just the, the sands and the wedges of the world that are that are driving those numbers. And then on page 18, I'll skip 17 again, as I mentioned, the active or the passive managers are all tracking their benchmark, which is what we, we want them to do. We have more information here on how the active options have performed versus their benchmarks over short and long periods of time. And the good news is really consistently across the board, with the exception of small cap, uh, adding a lot of value versus benchmarks over long periods of time. We did see a little bit of lag over the quarter, but over the, the year, the three years, the five years, the majority of options outperforming. Um, we mentioned the small cap impact of the name stocks or, or SPID rather. Um, so do you want to spend a quick second on that? I know we've talked a lot about that asset class and that'll be on page 19. Um, so you'll see for the quarter, a number of well, all of your managers lagged their benchmarks. So during the second quarter, we saw these meme stocks taking off. And it's roughly, I think it's nine or 10 stocks in the index, but they drove about 15% of that benchmark return from just these nine stocks. I think AMC was up 450%. These stocks are being driven by expectations set by primarily social media. So different discussion ports. Those are not necessarily, those, those price increases are not based on what we typically see, expectations for earnings and growth. Uh, so your institutional managers are acting as fiduciaries for the plan. So we're hiring folks that are thinking long term um, and making more realistic uh, investment decisions. So they're not loading up on BlackBerry or all these other speculative names. So when those meme stocks are running, your managers are lagging. We're okay with that. We actually think that's good. We don't want for our participants as fiduciaries, we don't want to load up on, on overly speculative names. Do it in your Robinhood account, that's great. You wish everyone the best, but when it comes to participant capital, we wanna think long-term. So we're actually okay and comfortable with the underperformance here. And then just to give a sense um, of how quickly this can change, in July, those mean stocks fell back and the mid cap equity option was up 0.86 while the benchmark was down 1.75. 
So that brings the year to date for the total SMID cap option that participants see, it's up 16.3% versus 14.9. Now that said, it could change and go back and forth again while we see this volatility, but the options broadly speaking doing what it should, which is smoothing out the volatility, giving participants a better experience. So for those that chose to go into that option, it's delivering what it should, which is that more consistent, higher quality approach. So everyone has the choice to, to either go active or passive. Um, and during this period of volatility, we're watching the managers closely, but, but they're navigating it the way that they should and that we would expect it and act out the day. And as with TCW and, and pretty much everything from our perspective, everything in the portfolio is always on watch. Um, we know you have a watch list that we keep an eye on all of it. So if anything were to change in that space too, um, we'll be very quick to, to give Laura and the team a call. But otherwise, no recommendations. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is we're also monitoring the transition uh, with the potential to empower. And thank you all. The communication has been great. You've been very upfront, transparent, accessible. Um, we've been in touch with Jeff and with Lauren and continue to be offering up our experience working with Empower over the years. We have a lot of knowledge there, a number of other clients. So um, we've been working with them and are happy to continue to be a resource to the extent that that's helpful for you all during the transition. Thank you. I know that was quick. Um, any, <laughs> any questions about the plan, the investment options before we dive into stable value? Any questions? Hearing none, proceed. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I will cover the, the stable value uh, update here. Uh, annually, we do, re do a review of the stable value fund, just given the size of the assets, as Elizabeth mentioned, the single largest active. Uh, option in the plan. Also, uh, very present in Goalmaker as well. Most of my comments are going to be here on this executive summary. Uh, and what we're going to focus on is since we do this annually, what has changed from last year and what has not changed? Really, what has not changed is in this first bullet point, and that Callan has generally a positive opinion of Gallagher. Um, and you know, that a lot of that has to do with the people, the process, the philosophy, the, the organization they built. Um, maybe uh, what has changed is, is what Paul mentioned on the phone, ownership changes, organizational changes that, that continue to occur. Um, we, we originally came to you all, and this touches on the second bullet point, but in, in 2019, talking about the succession planning that has taken place or was taking place at the time. Uh, as that has, you know, begun to roll off and, and really become a little bit more dated, Galliard has shown some stability, uh, which we wanted to see within the personnel. Uh, and, and, you know, there, there hasn't been a massive flight of assets out of this stable value fund, as, as Paul mentioned, firm-wide. They're managing $94 billion, $74 billion of that is in stable value. Uh, and, you know, this also, uh, what, what occurred when, Wells Fargo uh, sold its retirement business to principal. Uh, along with that, those Wells Fargo stable value fund clients that were Wells Fargo uh, record kept were going to transfer to principal's stable value fund. Uh, even with that flow out, uh, the flows have been you know, modest at best. So the, 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 the um, flagship Wells Fargo asset management stable value fund was at 25 billion at its peak today, and it is around 24 billion in assets under management. So, um, really, like I said, modest flows out. Uh, there was a notable departure uh, that we mentioned here in this fourth bullet point. I won't, I won't cover the, the third bullet point. I, I do think Paul covered that well. That is something that we'll continue to monitor, and, and right now we don't consider it actionable. But the fourth bullet point there was a departure with Laura Sell. Uh, they don't intend to uh, replace Laura's position. Uh, they do have maintained a deep bench in, uh, and, you know, where she was, uh, where her responsibilities were. Uh, and, you know, that is, you know, just something that we would highlight, but not actionable at this time. Notable, but not actionable. And then also no change in, in terms of uh, Gallier's process. And that's what we want to see in an institutional manager. Certainly, you want to learn from your mistakes, but you don't want to be continually reacting to the marketplace and 
uh, you know, you want to see the manager stick with their convictions, and, and that is what Calgar has done. Um, I will say, just Paul mentioned them too, and, and maybe we'll touch on this very briefly, but uh, the, the interest rate environment has changed since last year, uh, and that is that it is less favorable to those who are long term investors in fixed income and long term investors in stable value. Um, and so, what we should expect is crediting rates will come down over time um, and, and make it a little bit more difficult for uh, long term investors to com compound at, at what we would expect you know, to be more reasonable rates of, of return. Um, if we want to turn to page six, I will just cover one. Uh, well, I'll make, I'll make a pretty big statement here is if. Uh, absent this organizational change that, uh, that Wells Fargo is going through where they're selling themselves to uh, the two private equity firms, uh, absent that change, we would likely be coming to you all recommending to remove them from the watch list. Uh, just given this change, we think it's prudent for you to, to keep them on the watch list for some time. Um, again, it doesn't force your hand at taking any action. It just highlights that we want to see that continued stability that I've talked about going forward. So far, uh, they have uh, exhibited that among their personnel. Um, and as part of this, they're going to have to rebuild a lot of their back office capabilities, which they originally had before they consolidated to Wells Fargo Asset Management. So they, they are going to likely build that back office back up again. I'm going to skip forward to page eight talk maybe just a little bit about uh, stable value and its many moving parts here. Uh, I will remind everyone for stable value, it is meant to be a capital preservation option. It is not meant to uh, really reach for the nth degree of income. It is meant to be capital preservation for participants. Don't lose money. Um, so here we are looking at two key measures of risk. In the top line chart, we, the blue line is Galliard's allocation to triple B fixed income. And this is not just Galliard, but it's the underlying managers, the total fixed income portfolio. Are they taking more risk than their peers? Uh, they have maintained a pretty ste steady allocation to triple B over time, uh, whereas they were a little bit uh, higher than peers uh, from the periods uh, 2016 to call it 2020. Uh, peers have begun to allocate more to triple B's. Uh, so I, we would say as of this snapshot in time, Galliard is uh, right around the peer group median for the allocation to triple B. Now, that is not the only measure of risk. Another measure of risk is duration or interest rate sensitivity. Is Galliard, you know, taking on some additional interest rate risk to squeeze out more return? And that is in the, the bottom chart in the the gray peer group shows the 90th through the 10th, or the gray kind of uh, uh, range shows the 90th through the 10th percentile in our peer group for stable value. The white line is the median, and Galliard's uh, interest rate duration is uh, the blue line. And they've been pretty steady on duration as well, uh, not noticeably different from that peer group median. So, would suggest that they're not taking on any. Uh, undue risk to again squeeze out that return. And then on page nine, and uh, I think I can wrap up here, but these are two of the more important performance metrics. So uh, earlier, what is the crediting rate that participants are seeing when they sign up for the stable value? Uh, you'll see that the crediting rate has mostly been above the peer group meeting. So yeah, you're just done well. Uh, offering more um, better rates of interest to participants. And then what is oftentimes predictive of that future crediting rate is this market to book, which will ultimately be amortized into that crediting rate. Uh, and market to book remains above 100, uh, has, I'd say, been around the median over time. And as, as of this uh, period ended, they are slightly ahead of the median on the market to book. And really, a lot of uh, what we have is redundant. I, I will maybe take a moment to mention fees on, on page 13. We know that that 
because uh, the, the pennies and paper clips are uh, a, a, an important component here. And um, just we know that we these don't add up to be pennies, but um, certainly squeezing out whatever we can. This shows what Paul mentioned earlier. Where do those wrap contract fees? And this is the chart on the 11th. Uh, are on the left hand side, wrap contracts, uh, what carrier has negotiated is below the median of the peer group here. We want to be the, below the median. Um, uh, 50 through 100 is good, uh, whereas uh, the top one is bad. Uh, so that 16 basis point, uh, really it's, it's 15 and a fraction. Um, it compares favorably to the peer group median, but it is a very tight grouping. Uh, 15 and, and 16, or one basis point really is the difference between the, ninth, the uh, 90th and the 10th percentile. And then as you move uh, to the right and look at just the overall uh, effective annual fee, that 5.86 basis points that Gallier charges is also very competitive as well. So uh, Gallier, I think on the whole, doing a good job. Uh, we recommend keeping them on watch at this time, just given organizational changes. But uh, as far as our review goes, we are certainly comfortable with you all continuing on with them. Any questions on stable value? Questions from the phone? Or in person? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll go to uh, Lauren uh, with a Update on some summaries and uh, and some of this will involve votes and we have some board members that have to leave at noon so we're going to try to get through this. Sure. So first, just a brief update on compliance. Uh, so there were no prohibited holdings held in the plans uh, during the quarter. On the guidelines, we continue to monitor investment manager guidelines on a daily basis. No material, as you noted, in the quarter. And we do have one update. So there was a new executive order that was issued on June 3rd that prohibits purchasing or selling securities of issuers that are identified as communist Chinese military industrial companies, or better known as CCMCs. If you remember, we talked about this a few meetings ago under the prior administration where we had an executive order. Uh, that prior presidential executive order has been revoked and replaced by the new order. So the new list of prohibited holdings um, has been revised to include some additional companies involved in surveillance technology. And this new order went into effect on August 2nd. We started our uh, testing on the new list with BNY Mellon on, on August 3rd. Um, that was it on compliance. If there are no questions there. I'll move on to the IPS update. So the investment policy statement it has been updated to reflect all of the changes that were previously approved by the board on the International Equity Fund, uh, both the active and the passive. So we do have the, the changes effective as of October 1st, since that is when we expect the transition to be completed. Uh, but, but that is it for, for the update, just kind of updating it to include the allocation to the new investment managers for the active fund and then the change in benchmark for the passive fund. And I believe we need a photo. So uh, these are things that have been presented to the board before. If you look into your uh, board materials or some part of uh, pages, but just a few headlines. Uh, and I think this has been, been deeply to share. Yes. And uh, so with that, I'll entertain a motion to accept staff's recommendation to update the investment policy statement. I move we approve it. Steve. I second it, Shavella. Thanks, Shavella. Any further discussion? Any none the clerk? Treasurer? Aye. Lorraine Johnson? Aye. Melinda Barron? Aye. Michael Lewis? Aye. Nels Roseland? Aye. Wyndon Hippler? Aye. Thank you, board members. Just uh, hang in with us so we have enough to uh, have a quorum to adjourn. So, uh, with that, we'll go to the International Fund Transition Update. Okay.
Uh, just a brief update here. So letters were sent to participants last week, notifying them of the changes to both the active international equity fund as well as the passive. And letters were sent to those participants that either hold both funds or one of those funds. Uh, we have retained BlackRock as the transition manager for the transition. And the transition is scheduled to start the week of September 20th. And that would allow the new managers to really begin trading in those new portfolios and those new accounts beginning on October 1st. And then on the passive fund, the change of the benchmark from the Acqui XUS to the Acqui XUS IMI will also take place on October 1st. So we'll kind of have a, a clean uh, track record for that, that last quarter of the year with the new strategies. Okay. Thank you. Four or three. Okay. Moving on to the 403B performance. If we look at page three, you can see total assets at the end of the second quarter were 30.5 million, 14.8 million in passive, and 13.3 million in the active funds. Um, if we move on to performance on page four, uh, looking at the active managers, starting with Metropolitan West. And just as a reminder, Metropolitan West, it's basically TCW. So the the changes that we talked about with the CIO retiring for the TCW separate account uh, would also impact uh, this fund as well. As far as performance, the fund was in line with their benchmark for the quarter and they did outperform on a year to date basis. And looking at the outperformance uh, year to date was really due to their issue selection within the corporate credit sector. I'm uh, moving on to the principal diversified real asset fund. They did outperform the benchmark for the quarter. They showed strong performance. They were up 6% as real assets overall had strong performance in the quarter. And they had some strong relative outperformance as well due to strong manager performance within the infrastructure sector. Um, moving down the line to the Vanguard Windsor 2 fund, they've outperformed their benchmark for the quarter and year to date. And this was mostly due to strong stock selection in technology as well as communication services. A T row price, they did outperform their benchmark in the quarter, but they are trailing year to date. Uh, they were overweight the communication services sector, which helped relative performance for the quarter. Uh, there is one item of note for T row price. So the firm did announce that their CEO, Bill Stromberg, will be retiring at the end of the year. Uh, there really is no impact to the on the investment side since he doesn't really have investment responsibilities. But along with his retirement, they announced that Rob Sharps, who is the current uh, president and head of investments, that he will be taking over as CEO of the firm. And the current portfolio managers on the large cap strategy do report into Rob. So they're making some reporting changes there where going forward, they'll report into uh, the head of global equity. And just as a reminder, there is a PM change on this fund as well. We talked about this a few meetings ago where um, the lead portfolio manager is retiring at the end of the year as well. And the associate PM will be taking over for him beginning in October of this year. So just a reminder that there is that change on the portfolio management side as well. And uh, just finishing up here, we have DFA small cap portfolio. They slightly underperformed the benchmark for the quarter, but they are outperforming for the year to date. And then finally, Bailey Gifford International Equity Fund, they did underperform their benchmark, mainly due to stock selection. Um, some of their holdings uh, gave back some returns. I know they hold uh, a European airline, which performed poorly on some of the negative COVID news, especially in Europe. Uh, so they did have some uh, stock selection uh, underperformance for the quarter, but but long-term performance uh, still looks strong. Happy to take any questions on fourth of the Any questions? Uh, just want to give you an update about our agenda. This is a 403B program discussion. You'll be hearing more about this in our next uh, board meeting. But um, as you know, the we have the 401, the 457, and the 403B. And uh, the 403B is specific uh, for people who are in public education. And given the enormity of these plans, I think the 457 may be the, not in terms of assets, but in terms of enrollees, may be one of the largest plans in the United States. 
given <clears throat> the fact that we have one of the largest pension plans in the world, and given the fact that uh, when you look at all of what we have to do with the treasurer's office, um, mainly focused on being the check delivery business, we just mailed out checks today to 346,000 retirees, which represented $560 billion for one 30 day period. And that was, that's, that's, that's what's happening as folks my age are starting you know, to retire. Given all that, uh, when you look at what can we, what are we great at and what can we be great at? Um, and I'm, it's difficult for me to ever say that there's something we can't be great at. But when you honestly look at the internal and the external pressures and challenges that we face in trying to compete with our 403B product against internal and external challenges, I have come to the conclusion that the board will need to come to this conclusion that we're never going to be great at our 403B offering. Internally, what that means is that we just can't, with six, $17 million in the planner, is it? 30, 30 million. With thirty million dollars in the plan versus fourteen billion in the other two plans combined, so now we're talking about thirty million versus fourteen billion. We can never get it to the scale that would give us the buying power necessary that's only associated with things that we do. The external factors are things that you can you can't sleep at night that you can actually read about uh, in terms of of uh, other vendors who are in this business. And I don't wanna paint a stereotype uh, these folks as a category, but I think, for example, in the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system, there are 15 vendors of 403B plants in that one school system. And when, and I'm not talking about, you have 15 investment options inside of a plan. Talking about there's 15 different plans, all of which have investment options under it. And uh, I'm sure this doesn't happen in North Carolina, but if you can't sleep at night and you Google this, you'll read about uh, external pressures uh, in terms of how these vendors, how, how they operate. Uh, you know, some things is uh, insignificant, even though it's my stomach's growling, so it's becoming more significant than Krispy Kreme donuts versus flat screen TVs in the teacher's lounges. And we can't offer donuts or flat screen TVs in teacher's lounges in order to be great in this business. And that's that's who we're competing against. I would learned a long time ago that, and I, I, I don't mean this, maybe I shouldn't say it, but uh in business you have to really size up who your competitors are and the sentence that i used to use before, uh, when i was in business is that it's hard to be as, as strong as your dumbest competitor so if uh if you have snoopy's hot dogs down the street here and i won the lottery and all i've ever wanted was to have a hot dog stand and I just decided to open up a hot dog stand beside Snoopy's and charge five cents for hot dogs. Because that's always what I wanted to do, but I won the lottery and money doesn't. You can never be as smart as, there's nothing Snoopy's can do to compete against that. And I hope this will marinate with you after you leave here. <laughs> but it's just hard to compete with these internal and external factors with our four or three B. So we're gonna be coming back to you with some recommendations on, uh, or what we could do about this. Uh, it could involve doing nothing. It could involve a freezing for new entrants. <clears throat> it could involve ultimately a, a transition uh, to give these folks an opportunity to uh, avail themselves of other types of plans. And we're being very delicate about this because we never want to be associated with 
taking something away. And I think I'm fairly clear to, or correct in saying that there's not a person who currently is participating in our 403B plan that could not participate in our 401 or 457. I think that's really fair to say. So it's not like we're taking something away and they're going to have to fend for themselves. So I'm saying all this because whether it comes to staff time, actuarial reports, investment updates, we're just never going to be great at the 403 business, 403 B business. And we are great at 401 and 457 business. So I just, uh, I'll answer any questions you might have uh, about what all this means. And uh, there's nothing to do today, but just to understand that there's internal and external, external factors at work that, that'll, in my opinion, prevent us from ever being really good at this. And just one of you will just comment on, just for example, the, not the mutual fund, what's the, What's the limitation of the board? So, so you have to have mutual funds in the plan. You can't use the CITs or separate accounts, which it forces you to use a higher, higher expense investment option. And that's by federal law. So no, that's another external factor. So anybody have any questions about this? Uh, I know some of you have been on the board when the 403B was <coughs> instituted in North mm -hmm. Carolina, but I'd be glad to entertain questions, you can reach out to me privately, you can email us. And uh, I want this to be uh, as, as much sunshine on this as, as, as humanly possible. Mr. Treasurer, I think you brought up some solid points. This does warrant a constructive, objective review. Um, I just, in the staff work that would be developed, the background and history about I wasn't on the board when this is all created that could be laid out in terms of their authorizing legislation um, growth since inception but yeah the, the multitude of vendors and the complexity for such a small proportion of the overall portfolio does create some obvious questions what value is that really providing to those individual participants compared to the other products we serve? Thank you. And I, and I would add to your comments what the expected growth was supposed to be eight years. Is it nine years or eight years? We went in in 2014. Seven years. <clears throat> so what was the expectation? And on top of that, what you triggered my mind is that I don't want to use the word blame, but we do get calls in our call center about a 403B plan that we have, don't have a damn thing to do with because, you know, people out there busting their tail, working one or two jobs, they hear 403B, we handle their supplemental, we handle their pension, we handle their health care. So generally they will just call us and say, you know, what happened here? Or why are these fees so high? We really don't have anything to do with that. It could be one of the 16 vendors in one school district, for example. Um, I think, uh, Everything you've asked for is, is appropriate. It gives us a, a, a structure to build off of to present a report that would you could do, do consider. Hey, a question, quick question. This is Steve. Is the intention to report back at the next meeting with such as your three alternatives, what to do, or is this a longer term process? back at the next board meeting and uh, we're not limited by things that happened on January 1, uh, but it would be nice if we, for example, decided to froze it, to, froze it, to freeze it to new entrants. You know, it, there is a sort of a sequence of how things need to be rolled, but uh, we want to, uh, we want to do this, especially from the board standpoint with eyes wide open. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Treasurer, I was here when we did this, and from my memory bank, the reason we did this was because the standard 403B services were really mostly a ripoff for teachers. The costs were too high, the management was not um, all that good, and uh, 
but the teachers were in it because that's all we had. And former treasurer um, Cole heard the message and was trying to help. Um, now you just said there is nothing stopping from every teacher from enrolling into our supplemental plans. Is that right? That's correct. Nothing stopping us. Well, I'll tell you right now, my position is that we do everything we possibly can to uh, convince the teachers to just do a rollover from their 403B to us, and that would be their, we could serve them better that way and um, help all the rest of our participants by adding another 30 million plus to the supplemental plan. How many people are enrolled in the 403B? 1,400. 1,400. We have 300. I mean, two. two I'm getting my retiree checks. How many? About 290,000 in the game. Never going to catch the number of retirement checks. Sorry, but no. anyway, we got 300,000 people in these total DBDC plans, and only 1,400 of them are in this plan. And you know, not to compare things, but we also, I'm the chair of the ABLE board, which means it stands for achieving a better life experience uh, for a way for people to put money away for a tax deferred uh, for folks with developmental disabilities. And uh, that plan is up to 15 million. I mean, there's there could be a opportunity here in the next couple of years. ABLE program will be larger than the 403B. So anyway. Any other comments from the board? I mean, on that subject. Uh, do we have anyone sign up for public comment? I would like to, if I can, take a moment. I'd like to, I'd like to, I'd like to recognize Raker Krishna, who has been part of the SRP staff since 2013. She's going to be moving on to a new role within our investment management group. Uh, you. Know, expanding her career but she has been a wonderful wonderful staff member she's done a lot for for the for the supplemental plans uh she has helped me a lot in my in my short time here onboarding and she's going to be greatly missed for her contribution rank and we wish you the best of luck in your new role and again thank you for everything you've done for the board the plans and our partners Moving up to the second floor. She's moving yes. to the second floor. <laughs> moving on up. <laughs> anyway, uh, any board members uh, have any closing uh, thoughts on the phone? Yes. I sat in and have watched two of the um, Zoom programs that Empower and the Credential have been doing yesterday. And then I called up the uh, one that I missed two or three weeks ago. Excellent job. Great. My compliments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any more members from the phone? Uh, just a couple of uh, brief things. Uh, I gave blood last week and I always take these opportunities to encourage people to give blood. Uh, as cheap as I am, it's the cheapest way to get a physical. <laughs> uh, the, the panels and the, the, the Red Cross uses, in my 62 years, I've been given, my, I'm on my 18th gallon, and, and I've been given this since high school. And uh, the, the screening and the panels that the Red Cross uses is superior to anything I've ever gotten at a, at a medical facility. So, uh, and uh, if you're as heavy as I am, and you have the blood type that I do, I always recommend double reds. Uh, it means you can only get stuck half as many times in the year. It takes 15 minutes longer, it's sufficient. Uh, the double reds are used, I think, for the, especially the uh, pediatric and the cancer patients. So, and uh, unfortunately, they're not doing the antibody tests. They stopped that on 
July 25th, I'm going to call the lady who had lunch with a few years ago, the president of the Red Cross. I, uh, I think that was a poor decision. I think that if people know, especially with the politicization of mask and vaccines that's going on in this country, people know that they can give blood and get an antibody test, really good antibody test free of charge. I think it's a selling point. So I just encourage people to get blood. I uh, want to thank all the staff for uh, making these plans possible and for obviously this board and myself as, are standing on the shoulders of all of you who, who make all these reports uh, go well. Uh, thirdly, I heard enough conversation today that there's some negotiations and things going on between different vendors. Well, hell, most of them are sitting here. Uh, we can just leave the room and y'all can just whatever. <laughs> whatever y'all trying to settle, you can just do it right here. Uh, and, uh, and lastly, uh, just to remind you that uh, just in the last uh, four weeks, we've had two uh, high sheriffs pass away while in office, uh, both young, younger than I. Uh, not killed in the line of duty, but just passed away. And I just want to uh, say to you that we struggled to find a better word, but we do have uh, a group here called the death team. And uh, the death team has the responsibility of, of dealing with these grieving beneficiaries and, and spouses uh, to get the benefits uh, flowing to them. And uh, I say that because uh, as you can imagine with what's going on health-wise in our state right now, uh, this group is very busy and uh, and being able to get these, uh, not just on the pension side, but on the defined contribution side, just being able to reduce the anxiety of these uh, individuals, no matter what level of public servant they were and, uh, and getting it right and keeping it right is, uh, is something that so just another part of what Tom's responsibilities that uh, nobody ever really thinks about. But I can tell you that uh, when a funeral home is calling you wanting to be paid, and they do want to be paid many times COD, uh, you know, being able to get these death benefits to them and, and get people the access uh, to these assets that their loved ones have uh, been building for a long period of time. It's just another important part of what we do. So I'd like that, to, uh, I, yes, Mr. Chevella, I'd like to second that um, pull and push to get folk to donate blood. I am a, a uh, regular blood donor. Um, I, I enjoy doing it because my type is always needed. And um, I just would like to also encourage folk to give blood if you're able to do so. Devella, uh, it's, it's ironic. I, the, the thing I always say, because I changed the organ and blood donation laws 12 years ago when I was in the General Assembly, but uh, uh, if you would take one, give one. Yeah. If they would just change the height, I could do the double thing, but do short. <laughs> yes, and uh, we'll just go in and tell them you're Beth Wood. <laughs> It'll be six one, but uh, and uh, ironically, and Chabella knows this on the double reds, which is the most bizarre thing I've heard lately. The weight requirement for women is higher than men. Yeah, the weight for women is higher than men. And the height requirement for women is lower than men. Yeah. I don't know if that's the that must have to do with iron or something. But uh, anyway, double reds are when you donate as often as Chevelle and I do, uh, you know, getting stuck less often, half as much per year is, you know, that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Brendan, did you expect to hear all that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just open and listening. <laughs> so listen, uh, welcome. Thank you. And uh, thank all of you for your participation and thank you for reaching out to us. And uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So move, Melinda. Second. When in second, any further discussion? Hearing not the clerk. Hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Treasurer Falwell. Aye. 
Shabella Thomas. Aye. Lorraine Johnson. Aye. Michael Lewis. Aye. Nels Roseland. Aye. And Steve Bean. Okay. We're here about adjourn. And uh we don't like to throw away anything, so a cup of coffee, take it with you. It's in the mm -hmm. it's